Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Good morning, everybody. I'll call the meeting to order. I think Mr. Turner has the honors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Will you bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this day that you have made. Let us be glad in it. And as we gather this day for the solemn purpose of Conducting the business of the county and its residents, we seek wisdom, we seek guidance, we seek humility, that we may hear one another and better understand one another in the issues before us today, and we seek the right as you give us the ability to see the right. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Can you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? Scott, we have one in the queue. Yes. Okay. Got the lines not lit up. What'd she say? She said not lit. <laughs> she said the lines not lit up. That was pretty good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm doing well. Did you have a good Easter? Yeah. Nice and easy. Yeah. Nice and easy. How about yours? Uh, yeah. Nice oh, it's peaceful. Okay. Uh, it's a pop off the G. Oh, the nice. Yeah. Yesterday nice. was beautiful. It was. Very nice. Good morning. You're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. And this is the first public comment period that is related to items on the agenda. You will have three minutes to provide your comment. If you could state your full name and address and then begin your three minute comment. Uh, my name is Henry Vine. I uh, live in 3450. I drive in Snow Camp. Good, good morning, commissioners. Uh, hope y'all are doing well today. Uh, this is uh, Henry. I uh, just wanted to. Uh, make a couple of comments on the uh, agenda items. One is uh, the incentive uh, that they're going to set the public hearing for. Uh, I would request if y'all could uh, present what this incentive is about and uh, in this meeting or a prior meeting before the public hearing so that the public has an opportunity to uh, listen to the presentation about what this is and uh, who is asking for this incentive. It would be more informative to the public to have this information beforehand uh, on the public hearing when the day of the public hearing. So uh, I know we've been in the past, we had not got that information until that day. So I would just ask that maybe you look at maybe getting this information, you know, out and uh, so we'll have an opportunity to look it over as this is. The second thing I would like to uh, address is the bonds. I know that each and every one of you uh, have uh, looked at this thing and it's been very uh, taxing and very confusing. But the one thing that I would 
like to make mention is you know, the citizen voted for $150 million uh, for the bonds to help, you know, with the schools and all the needs that are there. Uh, not 176 or whatever may be uh, utilized due to the premiums. Uh, the debt should be 150, uh, not 176. Uh, that's what the system's approved. If there's $300 million worth of need that's been reported, uh, then it should come back to the voters and ask for the additional money in bonds. So as you deliberate this, I hope that you will take it into consideration that, you know, the citizens voted for $150 million for the ABS, not $176. And again, I appreciate whatever, what each and every one of you do, and thank you for your service, and I um, hope you have a good meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burns. I don't see any other calls. No. Okay. That is it, Mr. Chairman. Just, just one response. Our agendas uh, and the packets are typically uh, posted Thursday afternoon before the commissioner's meeting. So we're not, uh, in, in fact, we're trying to get them out as early as possible. But the agendas typically are not even set until. Uh, the Wednesday afternoon uh, preceding our the meeting the following Monday um, and thank goodness we try to give our wonderful clerk time enough to get things prepared and uh, and so forth so that's the reason they're posted on Thursday afternoon uh, this was a little unusual in that we had Good Friday um, and uh, it, although it was posted uh, at least I got mine Thursday afternoon uh, and so I think it was posted at that time. And Mr. Vines, we appreciate your comments. Any other comments? Okay, do I have a motion for the approval of the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> Unanimous. Thank you. We also have our consent agenda. Any comments or issues regarding the uh, consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. Any comments? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Again, unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, Ms. Crawford. And before you start, uh, Mr. Haygood and I have talked about the railing, and uh, that's going to be resolved very soon. Oh, great. So, just want to say thanks for your pointing that out. Thanks. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I want to thank the commissioners and the county manager and my veteran service board for supporting our veteran Vietnam breakfast we had last Monday. It was a great event. In honor of our vets, um, COVID has prevented us from having any in-person events, and it's always heartwarming to see the camaraderie between the vets. I've actually been getting emails about how much they enjoyed it. Veteran services has been underrepresented in the past. I plan to change that. We, I'm gonna give you a few small important facts to us. We are small but big in power. I have a lot of ideas to grow our department and increase outreach in the future. And I just want to take this opportunity to share a few statistics um, that are interesting I think you'll enjoy. North Carolina has more than 100,000 active duty service members. Over 600,000 veterans living in North Carolina. 200,000 receive VA benefits. Alamance County has approximately 12,000 veterans. One in nine North Carolinians are veterans. 2,700 veterans are moving to Alamance County per year. 
In 2019, Alamance County veterans were awarded $100,814,000 in benefits. Our duties have much increased over the past five years. In the past, we were able to request medical records, service treatment records, and the claims rater went through them. Now, it's our duty as service officers to request all those records or have the veteran bring them to us. And that's our job to go through the enormous load of military <coughs> and medical records now. So, um, and we want to do this because we want successful claims. Mm -hmm. This evidence is important to our veterans to get the benefits they do deserve. This is a long process. In the process, sometimes we saw veterans lose their homes, their cars, even their families break up while waiting on VA to make decisions because they can be slow, but COVID obviously <coughs> slowed them down even more in the past few months. We not only assist with benefits, we're counselors, paralegals, and resource finders. We form lasting relationships with our heroes. They deserve the very best service available. And I'm proud to say that our office has received two certificates of excellence from the North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Alamance County is rated one of the best service offices in the state. Now, I'm gonna let you guys hear from a few veterans that are familiar with our services. <coughs> Good morning, County Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I'm Jerry Peterman, live at 637 Johnson Avenue in Graham. Uh, I'm a member of the Veterans Board across the street and also a board member of the Alco Vets. Uh, I probably, as much as anybody in the room, know how hard it is to do the budget saying yes and no to the things that you're going to have to do here pretty soon. I do want to talk to you about the Blue Water Navy Veterans Bill of 2019. This is a, a bill that is unknown to anybody. The, the United States finally admitted that the, the Navy veterans are, will have coverage through the VA. It's going to bring hundreds of thousands of people to the table to this group that's across the street. Uh, what it is, is says anybody within 12 miles of the coast of Vietnam has benefits for Agent Orange or anything else that was covered of in-country sailors or in-country uh, Army, Navy, uh, Marines. The Marines that are on the ships were also covered. So what is that going to do? It's, they're setting up presumptive illnesses, hearts, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, skin, uh, prostate cancers. All these are going to be pres presumptive, which means they're going to say, yes, we probably caused this for this guy in 1971. 50 years later, they're coming back and saying this. So hundreds of thousands of people are going to go to the veterans for help. These, these ladies are going to be overrun. They do need some help. Mm -hmm. And again, there's nobody in the room knows how hard it is to say yes to added employees or no to added employees, but they are going to need some help because thousands are going to be here when they hear about this bill. Uh, right now, the biggest one is in Congress, which is high blood pressure. If they cover high blood pressure on the presumptive thing, every Vietnam veteran is going to be at their door. So just keep that in mind when you have a chance. I know some of the other veterans want to speak, and I appreciate your time, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, yes, thank, you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. We'll note he is the mayor of the city of Graham, by the way, just for the record. Good morning. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Paul Williams. I recently retired with over 30 years as a paramedic with Alamance County. I'm a United States Marine and currently serving on the Veterans Service Board. Today I would like to speak about the needs of the service office. The Veterans Service Office sees approximately 60% of our veteran population. There are only three service officers that handle these many benefits these vets receive. They have a tough job. 
the vets here rely on these ladies not for only money, but for support. The phones are constantly ringing. Vets are coming to the door. Well, there's no receptionist. Staff has to leave an unattended vet or call or cut off a phone call. This increase of vets is due to two reasons. One, Caswell County does not have a service officer. Number two is uh, they get overflow from Guilford County also. Because I've heard that there's some people that's waited a year and never got a call back. So they come over here because they know these ladies are going to take care of them. Uh, this is unacceptable. I'm asking you to give this office more help. If they had more staff, they could certainly help more vets, which would generate more money in our county's economy. The vets in this county deserve better, and this office would never, and I say would never, turn away a veteran. These ladies are also working a job that is not what they are paid for. Tammy Crawford is the director of the department. However, she is classified as a service officer. Shannon Tyler and Cindy McGivery are classified as assistant service officers, but are highly qualified service officers. This is insane, insane and unfair. Would you want to have the responsibilities for one job and get paid for a lesser position? I don't think so. My job is to support this office and in turn, return, they support our veterans. As a county, I think we can do better by them and give them the resources they need. Uh, I was talking to them this morning and I said, every one of y'all have a little bit of Marine in y'all. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's a saying in the Marine Corps, Semper Fi, short for Semper Fi Delis. That's a Latin term that is, says, always faithful or always loyal. You ain't gonna find better people than that right there, over there. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Thompson knows that too. She got a little Marine in her. <laughs> I, that should scare you. <laughs> so I'm just asking, these ladies work their tails off and they need, desperately need some help. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. write anything down but good morning my name is Yolanda Kirby um, I am the co-chair of the Veterans Board of Alamance County um, I am also a Navy veteran I served from 2001 to 2006 with a tour in Iraq in 2003 um, so I'm here this morning not only as a co-chair but as a veteran of this county and also a former VA employee so I've seen it from both perspectives um, I actually stumbled, literally, well not stumbled, my mother threatened to drag me to their office back in 2008. Um, when, she's a nurse by trade, so she, when I got home in 2006, transitioning from the military is hard. Mm -hmm. It is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do besides being a mother. Um, I did not know what my next move was, what I was supposed to do. Um, I think I may have been 23 at the time, so I wasn't aware about benefits, because when I thought of the VA, I thought of my grandfather. My grandfather was passed away at the VA. I didn't think about me being 23. And so when I went to that office, I walked in, I didn't know what to ask for. The lady sat and took time to talk to me to see where I was at in life and what I needed. She filled out the application for me to go to the VA and they helped me with my paperwork. I didn't understand any of those processes. And so you have people that age now are coming home with life altering illnesses. They may be 23, but they may not have a, a limb. They may have a traumatic brain injury or PTSD. That is life altering forever. And these women are part of helping them get on track. I don't know where I would be if that office was not there. I didn't even know it was there. I found it in the phone book um, and I didn't know. So I'm, I'm thinking because I like I work at the VA, I've seen so many young people come in that office like that. And that process with the claims process, my first pro claim that I think I filed, it took 18 months from beginning to end. And so you think if that's one person and they had to work with me that long, how much time that takes for them with individuals and they have several hundred that come in there every month. Mm -hmm. I know you all have a lot of things to do, but our veterans in our county need us to be here and know that they're here. And sometimes they may need help and don't even have the words to ask for the help. Um, but I've never seen these ladies turn anyone away. 
um, there you always feel welcome when you go in there but they are overworked they work before hours after hours and it is time consuming and I just want them to know that they have the support of everybody in the county um, because if they're successful then our veterans are successful which means they stay here they build homes they raise families here they work here they start businesses here all things that our whole our county as a whole will benefit from Thank you Thank for your you, time. Amanda. Thank you for your service. Thank, Thank you. you. I, my pleasure. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change anything in the world. It's the my my son tells everybody his mama was a soldier, so that just makes me proud. Aww. Yeah, it makes us proud too. <laughs> I'm Janelle Wolves, and I am a Navy veteran. First thing I want to say is thank you for having integrity by saying the prayer and the pledge of allegiance. I was very impressed. My claim took nine years, and my experience with the VA is they are every step trying to stop you from doing anything. We have a phrase, I work with a couple of advocacy groups, lie, deny, hope you die. My first impression of all of this was when I first went to this office before this lady took over. And I walked out of there thinking, I have no chance I'm doomed. I'm never going to get this done. I went back two months later, and the lady that was running it, she didn't even know who I was. And she was working there. When they took over, they made a life and death difference in my life. The VA, I've had a lot of experience dealing with them. Their first step is they, you can't call them, you can't talk to them, you can't get a hold of them in person. They lose things. They, they'd go out of their way to deny every veteran their benefits unless you li literally missing parts these ladies are the exact opposite they're not part of the VA so they have to deal with the same crowd it's, it's horrible these people gave me hope and I went nine years when I started coming up there when they were there I was in a financial situation that pretty much I thought I was gonna have to find homes for my dogs and die I really seriously I was, I was making my plans to save my dogs so I could leave this earth and not deal with the things that the VA was putting me through. And if it, this was the first, first group that I went to and they gave me a, a 180 turnaround. They helped me, they went out of their way, they did things that nobody in the VA will do for you. And they are overworked and they do need a receptionist because I can't tell you how many times I was sitting in their office they had to get up and do this or get up and do that because a receptionist is your least paid employee and they really need to have one because if you know the doors are locked now and they have to go let you in and there's a reason for that and that should be a receptionist doing that because the paperwork and the time it takes to do anything at the VA nine years nine years from, from September 2011 until June 2020. And they, they, they don't, this presumption thing that he mentioned, they fight that tooth and nail. Because there's a lot of things that are presumptive that you shouldn't even be arguing about and they don't even acknowledge it. They do a lot of things, they tell you this and then they change it to something else after you've met that. And these are the first people a veteran's gonna see or talk to. That's the difference of life and death. Because if you get the first attitude that I got, I, I don't even sure why I went back the second time because it was obvious that they weren't, that, that wasn't gonna help me at all. And then this lady took over. It was a difference of night and day. And one last thing, when you think about veterans and what they've gone through, remember September 11th and how stressed everybody was that day. Imagine living like that every day, 24 hours a day, not, not eight hours, 24 hours a day for a year. Seeing people that, what they call battle buddies, get turned into mist in front of your eyes. Seeing things like that, and then come back here thinking they're gonna help you, and they go out of their way to deny. Delay, deny, hope you die. These people are not part of the VA, and they have to deal with those same bureaucratic stuff. It's terrible. But these ladies are lifesavers. And I am, I am absolutely swear on a Bible that's the truth. And they need, they need more help. 
they need to be able to do their job in a, in a more efficient way because they're fighting the most inefficient part of the government I have ever seen. And they, they do it deliberately. It's intentional. They figure you'll just give up. And a lot of veterans do. But these ladies helped save my life. And that is a fact. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Might indicate that our budget hearings are coming up on April 21st and 22nd, and obviously you'll be there. Yes. So <laughs> well, I can personally attest to that too. Tammy and her team really did help my mother-in-law after my father-in-law passed away. He was a Navy veteran, World War II. And uh, trying to go through the VA, she didn't even live in Alamance County at the time. She lived in Guilford County, but we got her over here. And Tammy got her fixed up, got everything squared away. Her team did. So uh, I appreciate that a whole lot. Thank you. My father indicate that uh, Mr. Turner and Mr. Haygood, I know they visited that office, and we appreciate your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, just want to say I was at the Vietnam Veterans Breakfast, and what a great event that was for fellowship for everyone. And just to get together, it's been a long time since a lot of people have just been together. Um, and, you know, a couple of the, of the guys said, um, you know, when, when we came back from Vietnam, we weren't celebrated, which, which we, we know to be true. Uh, but to hear individual stories about that really hits home. Um, and I know that veterans are celebrated at the Veterans Service Center. Uh, and you guys do a wonderful job, and I'm going to be inclined to support that request come budget time. Um, when I was um, there the last, oh my gosh, it was, you know, I'm a ridiculous Army mother. I mean, my house looks like a gift shop for the Army. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> my son's so embarrassed. Um, but I got a chance to be in between two drill sergeants, Paul and was it Mr. Harris? And I actually thought I was, <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> I went to the educators workshop down at Paris Island to learn what it takes to put, you know, all these services and all this funding and all this uh, grit into a young person that volunteers to go there to get off that bus and put your feet on those yellow feet. I did that for a whole week. I thought I was going to get to watch some movies and go to the gift shop. They about killed me because of things we did at a minute fraction of what a real Marine does, but it was golly. Um, I shot one of those machine guns. I don't know what it's called, but I know it had a lot of bullets in it, okay? <laughs> so anyway, uh, don't ever worry about me going to work for the Sheriff's Department. It's not going to happen. But I did, I saw the sacrifices and what it took, and when I was standing in between Paul and Mr. Harris, <laughs> they were right back when they were in BASIC. They were telling me things that my son had told me that he went through with BASIC. And I thought, how do you do that? I, I mean, I mean, we were on the bus going back to the base and our drill sergeant, God Jr., Stephanie King, I'll never forget her, <laughs> was coming across the field. Look, like all she needed was like the Mission Impossible theme song playing behind her. And I offered the bus driver $500 to take me off the base and get us out of here. And, and she said, she'll find you. And she would have, and I would have paid her big bucks to be a principal at any school. Oh my gosh. <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is there, is there is nothing that a wannabe like me can ever say compared to what a soldier can really say that's experienced that. Um, my dad was a veteran and I went through the VA with him for three years with cancer and heart and, and healthcare wise, he had really good services, but he had me there with him as his advocate all the time. And it's just like anything, you have to have somebody there. But that's not the same story for everybody. And sitting in oncology with all these veterans, the stories I heard, and they went right back to that moment when they were serving. It was just phenomenal. I, you can't do enough for a soldier, as far as I'm concerned. And um, I've, and Tammy's working with my son. He's DD-214, and he's got some hearing problems because he was on a, he was in tanks, and they blowed stuff up. So that's just noise. But anyway, um, she's been to the jail for me with a client that it's just heartbreaking because veterans have hard times coming back adjusting, especially if they've been in the hospital and <coughs> had a lot of medication put in them. When they leave the hospital, their bodies don't just stop that and they sometimes, like anybody else, can make some bad choices and it can own them. But um, a receptionist is like your 911 coordinator. You ask the front receptionist at any school, you let a mad parent come in there because their kid has told them maybe not the whole story 
and they come in there wanting to kill a principal because all they know is one story. Your receptionist is your diffuser. It's like a 911 manager, and it is there to really be almost in a defense situation to help cool off that situation. And, um, and you, that's the face of your agency, just like the nursery is the first impression of your church. It's, it's that important. And um, I, I just cannot say enough. One of my things I ran for was veteran services. I want a building. I want to have their own building. I want to have their easy parking. I want to be all about them, nothing else, not in the corner, not somewhere upstairs, but all about them. Because the day they signed up to go, they went, some came back, some didn't. I was a lucky mother, my son come back. And, uh, but not everybody can say that. So um, I don't think this county or any county in the United States of America can ever serve, give service back to the ones that have served us so selflessly. 22 people a day in the military take their lives. That's absurd, but that's reality. And um, we need a strong mental health program here for our veterans because um, Corey Spore that worked for Mark Walker's office that was my first start into going around seeing other veteran centers told me, he said, your son was deployed, I was deployed. I was in Iraq, he was in Poland, two different worlds, but he said, no matter where you go and get deployed, you're gonna come back not the same because of where you've been. So um, I, I, I think it's a real time for Alamance County to really man up and put the red carpet out for their veterans because they sure walk that red carpet for us. We sit in this room and we get to talk all free because of our military. So. Um, I'm just very thankful that I know this group. They're a blessing, and I know everybody that they've served and worked with can say the very same thing about them. So, that's it. <laughs> we just want to say thanks. Absolutely. Mr. Mac Williams, he is the president of the Chamber of Commerce, and we welcome you here again today and wish you would not retire. Yeah, he's a short timer. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I hate it too, but uh, it, it's you know everything has its time and and it's my time. <laughs> time but, to play. Uh, but before we go, before I go, uh, still a few months. I, I think the end of October uh, is the time frame I've given. So, got some things to do between now and then. One of which is uh, another public hearing uh, for another good economic development story. Uh, this was a particularly good one. We've got an expansion of a local company which is always good yes uh, and uh, I'm, I'm here to ask you all to consider setting the date for the hearing uh, for April the 19th I believe that's correct it is correct Andrea <laughs> to uh, April the 19th uh, for Lotus bakeries in Mebane I have a, they have a proposal uh, for possible expansion of their Mebane facility and we'll be here the 19th with all the details. The contract will be worked up and then the agenda packet for the 19th. Uh, to Mr. Bynes's point, we've been doing it this way now for several years, letting you know who it is two weeks in right. advance. And then there's the, there is the uh, performance agreement that's in the packet prior to the meeting of the hearing, uh, plus a, a headline or two before that. So hopefully that will again as a reminder of the process that we do here for transparency I'd like to move that we put this on for the public hearing on april the 19th second i just would like to whenever just that's great but i remember whenever we met like two he was talking to us about all this kind of stuff as a brand new board member i've heard things about incentives pros and cons and i'd asked if our county had ever done like a incentive 101 because um the public may perceive it one way, the way it may be written. Um, you can have five different reporters to report on one thing and there'll be five different stories. And, and that's just the beast, that's just what it is. And I'm not fussing about anything like that. But I would hope in the future that we can do something like that to really educate our public instead of telling our public. And it's like the agenda, whenever John, you're talking about we got the agenda Thursday. Well, we are the commissioners. We are supposed to get the agenda and we are supposed to know what the agenda is. Not everybody gets involved and listens till they can get mad about something later. At the school system, same thing. Anything that's making big decisions with your tax dollars. So um, just before October, <laughs> I would love to have an incentive 101 if that's okay. Well, I can certainly work with the county manager and Andrea and you all and try to figure 
something out and what that would look like and when. So Thanks, Mac. I appreciate that. Be happy to participate with that. But thank you for your consideration, and we'll see you on Monday, the, Monday evening, the 19th. You got to vote on it first. Ah. <laughs> okay. We're close. Mark. I'll wait for that. <laughs> we just got to vote now. <laughs> Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, sir. Now, okay. Thank, okay. You. thank you very much. All right. Thank you. We're starting to depopulate. <laughs> uh, Miss Harper. Good morning, Foxy. Good morning. How you doing this morning? Doing great. Before she starts, I'm so honored to be on their team. And I will tell you, I told them if this group of women went to Washington, D.C., our budget would be balanced. <clears throat> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> We try to be very careful, and we'd like some men. We've lost all the men on the committee, so we're recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> and good morning, and I am Foxy Harper, the current chairperson of the Alamance uh, County Senior Services Committee. We were formerly uh, called by a different name that was a little longer and a little more complicated, but basically mm -hmm. our function is as the planning committee in conjunction with the Piedmont Triad Regional Council Area Agency on Aging, and that's a mouthful. Um, it's an honor to talk with you this morning and want to uh, talk with you about our committee and its work. I'd like to introduce another member of our committee who's here. Uh, this is you you were voting on her uh, extension on the nursing nursing home community advisory committee as Virginia Miller, but we call her Gail, and so this is Gail Miller, and she is our current delegate to the Senior Tar Heel Legislature. When I was elected to be um, chairperson for this committee, I moved over from delegate to alternate. Uh, felt somebody else needed to have that responsibility. In your packet, you should have this booklet. And uh, the demographics <laughs> and, and statistics that I'm uh, going to provide for you at the beginning are from this booklet. And there's a lot of information about aging in our county. This is specifically uh, focused on Alamance County. And uh, I realize it's dated June of, of 2018 but that's the re most recent uh, set of uh, statistics that were available to me. Hopefully we'll be getting an updated booklet like this before long. I'm sure you're well aware of the rapid growth in our county, uh, but are you aware of the growth projection for older adults? By 2036, Alamance County is expected to grow by 47,525 residents, and of that, 44% will be age 60 or over. By 2036, one in four Alamance County residents will be over 60. Projections for the Piedmont Triad region growth for 2015 to 2035 indicate that Alamance County is expected to continue to lead the 12 county region in the rate of growth. Ensuring adequate quality of services and care for our older adults is a current necessity and requires planning and preparation for the impending needs of the anticipated population growth. I'm sure you've heard of the silver tsunami. This is it, <laughs> we're in it. <laughs> With aging comes change in health and ability to function in many different ways and on various levels. I think you would agree that remaining in our homes with as much autonomy as possible is our optimum goal. However, with declines in functions that make independence uh, possible, older adults can receive essential services that make the difference in remaining at home or not. Help with activities of daily living, such as bathing, dressing, grooming, and with other needs such as housekeeping, laundry, cooking, shopping, transportation. All of those are key to having the choice to be at home. 
here's something about our county. Uh, every county in the United States is assessed annually to reveal how many healthy residents there are and how long or how healthy as residents are in the county and how long um, they will live. In North Carolina in 2018, the county health rankings put Alamance County at 50th for health outcomes out of our 100 counties and 48th for health factors. The growing aging population is significantly challenging federal entitlement programs as well as significantly increasing the demand for home and community-based services like those that are offered by the Area Agency on Aging through its network. Home and community-based services allow individuals to remain at home and to make choices. They can live with dignity and independence at a fraction of the cost of skilled nursing care or other institutional settings. And there are um, some t statistics that uh, show what a major difference there is in cost that impacts the county uh, in many different ways. Social determinants such as housing and transportation, financial support and food security can account for 80% of health outcomes. And we only rate, rated 48th in the state back then. I hope that concerns you as much as it does me and our committee. We'd like to be doing better. The Senior Services uh, Committee is comprised of delegated, dedicated, not delegated, dedicated volunteers who are tasked with working with the Area Agency on Aging and our funded partners to meet service needs of our aging population. We analyze the service needs, we prioritize them, and then allocate the Home and Community Care Block Grant funds to provide as much care to our seniors as possible. And I say as possible because there are always waiting lists for services and unmet needs due to insufficient funds. That is uh, one of the uh, ongoing challenges that the Senior Tar Heel Legislature um, works towards every year, every biennium, to request better funding for senior services through, through that block grant. Our funded partners are ACTA, Alamance Meals on Wheels, Alamance Elder Care, Home Care Providers, Friendship Adult Daycare Services, and the J.R. Canodal Senior Center. This past year has been extremely challenging for them with all the restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to give you a little bit of an update about how they've been functioning under those restrictions. Friendship Adult Day Services, which has people coming to spend the day with them uh, one or several days per week to give respite to their uh, care providers, <clears throat> has not been able to have anyone on their site. So those families are not getting respite for the past year. And they have continued to function as a support through telephone contacts on a daily basis with the caregivers and providing them whatever uh, information and assistance that they have been able to do in that fashion. <coughs> Excuse me. Alamance Elder Care provided care management by phone, distributed care packages to caregivers countywide, and not just those enrolled in their program. It was open to any caregiver who heard about it and wanted to take part in the program. And they also provided and continue uh, to provide caregiver education opportunities, but that's had to be online rather than uh, in an in-person setting where vendors could be there for people to interact with and not optimum, but still goes on. ACTA has provided medical transportation, but was unable to spend all of their home and community care block grant funds for general transportation because they were not transporting clients to congregate meals or friendship adult daycare. 
underspent by $45,162 act to release those funds for the committee to reallocate to other partners. Meals on Wheels serves the nutritional needs of homebound older adults. It has been unable to provide hot meals daily using volunteers to deliver them for the past year. Instead, frozen meals have been delivered on a weekly basis by their staff. With COVID-related family first, family first and CARES funding uh, combined with the Home and Community Care Block Grant funds that they have served even more clients um, and at times they almost met the needs of everybody on their waiting list. <clears throat> but just about the time they get the waiting list down, more people get on it. So it's a constant need. Um, as an, to give you an idea of, of who they're serving, uh, how many they're serving, in December of 2020, they provided 6,323 meals to 322 home and community care block grant clients, 1,456 meals to 81 clients under the Family First funding, and 802 meals to 100 clients under the CARES funding. One of the concerns is Family First and CARES funding are not gonna be there forever. And what happens then when that funding is depleted uh, and no longer renewed by the government, um, where, where do those people get, the, get their meals? Uh, how do they fund that? So that's, that's gonna be a challenge for all of us. Alamance County Community Services provides the Congregate nu Nutrition Program and their purpose is to promote, maintain, and improve the health and well-being of older adults by providing nutritionally balanced meals five days a week at four congregate meal sites located throughout the county. Those sites have been closed, but the clients have been able to pick up a weekly supply of frozen microwavable meals through a parking lot drive through process. And um, in December, they provided 2,600 uh, 2, meals to their clients in that uh, method. Other things go on besides getting food at those congregate sites. And uh, of course, one of the things that we are extremely concerned about is the lack of socialization. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, mm -hmm. those folks are, are pretty hungry for that. Home Care Providers has continued to provide in-home, hands-on, uh, care to the frail, elderly, and disabled communities throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Staff and patients were screened each day before care was delivered, and all staff wore appropriate PPE during delivery. If a patient was COVID positive or an individual classified as a person under investigation, additional precautions were taken to provide care. Home care providers was able to obtain and sustain ample PPE for their care delivery. But these, these are folks that are getting those hands-on uh, bathing, dressing, grooming, housekeeping services um, where without them, they probably would not have been able to remain in their home. They probably would have been going into nursing care. The Senior Services Committee entertained requests for the released funds from ACTA from our other uh, partners the $45,162 were reallocated as follows. $13,662 to Meals on Wheels, $12,000 to Alamance County Community Services, and $19,500 to home care providers. And I believe you all um, received that information and approved it. For the past two years, the committee has worked on developing, developing an aging plan for Alamance County. And in February, we voted on that plan, and you should have a copy of that in front of you. Um, and that is uh, being brought to you today for your approval. Uh, I hope that we will soon begin working, well, we've begun working on our action steps, but we're gonna be implementing them pretty soon. Um, the action steps are, are not included in the plan that you have. That's the next 
uh, process that we're going through under the, the basic uh, overall strategic plan. Your approval of that aging plan is needed, of course, but your support of it is even more important. Um, as we go forward, it will be key to have your support in order to implement and be successful in meeting the needs of our older adults. If you've uh, looked at the aging plan, have you any questions about it? I don't have no. any questions, but, but. Uh, <laughs> your work with ACTA is just wonderful. That's one, uh, people think of ACTA as just a bus service. It is so much more than that. That's right. Um, Mr. Carter and I both have served on that board in the past, and uh, what a wonderful job Alamance County Transportation Authority, ACTA, does for this county, and yes. we appreciate you working with them. Well, one of the things that happens is in, in our process of determining the allocations for the, the various partners is um, we, we have to go through and look at all of the services they provide and come up with a prioritization that then informs our decisions about the amount of money that they get. And we keep going back to the fact <laughs> that without the transportation, they That's don't right. get to daycare, they don't get to congregate meals, they don't get to their medical appointments. So um, it, it is very high on the prioritization list so that the other things can happen as well. Right. And their buses aren't just uh, get on the bus and ride, they go door to door, they carry wheelchairs often uh, upon their vehicles. Uh, do just such a wonderful job. They do. And not everybody lives in a town or city that has That's transportation. True. So it really is important to our rural areas of the county to have them uh, able to bring them to the needed services. And if you're in a wheelchair, you can't walk to the to the uh, link spot mm -hmm. for pickup. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> and even if you're on a walker, um, getting on a bus that's not equipped for you, not an easy thing to do. <laughs> if they even let you on, I'm not sure about that. Don't guess they can refuse you, but it it does complicate things a bit. Well, that makes it easy, and that's that's a good thing. Let me say one other thing, and this is not to us seniors. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I remember the day when I became one. I was working in an area agency on aging, and all of a sudden I, I could be my own client. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, what I want to say is to the younger folks, uh, if they will look after their health, their education, I see a number of educators in the audience, uh, their own personal safety, go smart places. Don't wind up 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning out somewhere you shouldn't be. Uh, and just be smart about their own thing, then they'll be old enough eventually to be one of us seniors. <laughs> so you just like to give the younger folks that heads up. <laughs> well, we would also request your assistance in any way you can help us in adding more members to the committee. As I listened to the veterans uh, representative here, um, that was a group that used to have a representative on the planning committee, not as a voting member, but as one of the community services that came and interacted with us. And they may be too busy for that at this moment, but it, it really is a partnership that would be um, very helpful to have because we, we have mutual clients and uh, would be good to work together. Um, but we, we do want to increase our numbers. Our bylaws say that we need a minimum of seven, and we've just gotten back to that. Uh, we were down to five, and up mm. to, uh, I think, 15. And the more we have uh, voting members, the better represented the county is. Um, the more uh, area, not only physical areas of the county, but also different backgrounds and uh, you know, different things that people bring from their experience. So any way you can help us recruit, we would be very appreciative of it. 
Well, you lost several members then since I was on the board on that board last year. We had quite. A, this past year has been hard. I, I also uh, am on the uh, community advisory committee uh, who visit the adult care homes, and um, and work for advocate for resident rights with the ombudsman. And both of our committees have really suffered trying to keep people. Um, working together with Zoom meetings is not optimum. No. You need that interaction of face-to-face -face and conversation and, and negotiation and subcommittees and things that, that need to go on that right. just have not been able to happen. So some people have gotten discouraged, felt like they weren't doing anything, and, and left us. Would you give your um, contact information so that citizens that would like to volunteer and work with you folks can do so. Your website, <laughs> all right, because <laughs> it is a county website. committee, and uh, so they they need to apply online, and then those applications are forwarded to our um, AAA office and the planner, uh, who is uh, Crystal Norman. And she is our our current planner that's assigned from the AAA to work with us, and um, and so it's it's kind of a a two-step process and then it comes back to you all to make the final approval of those folks that have applied. How many vacancies do you have right now? We can have as many as eight more people on there by our okay. bylaws. Well I'm sure we all have friends that might be willing to serve and uh, either to support their their senior adult family members or themselves being senior adults. And we and particularly can, would love to have caregivers as a part of it. That's really hard to um, recruit because caregivers are so busy but maybe someone who has been a caregiver but maybe has lost their loved one right uh, they got the experience but now they have the time perhaps and uh, so they would be able to have a lot of good input to our committee well Foxy thank you for coming before us this morning I'll make a motion to approve the Salamance County Aging Plan for second. February 16 to 2021 I second that and you can give me time to say anything. I just wanted to, to add on something to just um, tag what you just said about some of your members. And that these are real committed people that get on commissions and committees and stuff had kind of gotten discouraged because of Zoom. Now, you took, we took $45,000 from ACTA, which is not running, and divided amongst others that were blown out of the water because of all the elevated need. Excuse me, they are running. And Do you know what I mean? That's that, the way it was, so to speak. <laughs> and, uh, but that, that category of spending, right, they were not able to right, use. not use it. So, and that went to the other three, which they each could have took the forty-five real easy, and it could have made a tremendous mm -hmm. difference because the thought of somebody ever being bumped off Meals on Wheels that has had to really be increased because of the increased need because of COVID everything like that and the one thing a person never need to, to lose is their purpose because if you don't have a reason to get up in the morning you don't want to mm -hmm. and when you're not socializing at whatever age this is depending um, that that's kind of gets people down and you kind of quit and so I think it's very important like elder care if you're a caregiver sometimes you've got to have a break and, and they and your your loved one is in a good safe place doing crafts having lunch fellowship and being with other people you can't put a price on that and all these other amazing in-home care and I mean just everything the Cronodal Center we can't forget our seniors they've paved the way for everything we've done and uh, boy can they tell us how coulda shoulda woulda so um, I just am so appreciative they, they have continued to uh, operate without any people there right no congregate meals no uh, exercise classes in-house uh, all of the you know the bocce courts and and hiking trails and things that they normally would use have not been a, op open to them but they have held classes on online um, and they have uh, done you know whatever possible to mm -hmm. reformat the senior games to <laughs> be yeah. able to at least have some portion of, of that happening but um, they they really do perform a tremendous service to people who are able to get out of their homes and and uh, participate it's a true blessing and well, we really appreciate your coming to the meetings and uh, prior to you mr carter attended the meetings and um, prior to him we we've, we've had pretty good support 
um, Amy Gailey was prior to uh, Mr. Carter, and uh, we really appreciate the support that we get by your attendance, and anybody's very welcome. Third Tuesday morning at 8.30, right now by Zoom, but uh, hopefully we'll get back to the Senior Center for our meetings before long. But we, uh, we welcome, it's an open meeting, anybody can come and attend, you don't have to be assigned. <laughs> You know, this is a really good testimony, too, to the interaction of the agencies and committees in Alamance County because mm -hmm. we've worked together to try and protect and maximize the benefit of the dollars we take in tax dollars. We all take that seriously. I know on this board and in the previous board, we all take seriously asking people for their money and then making sure, as best we can, that we're spending it appropriately. Mm -hmm. So. And you poll your churches, your highest tithing Sunday is going to be after the seniors get their Social Security checks. <laughs> that ethic, you, that's, a, that's a strong ethic. So. That's true. A motion and a second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Fox. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate Thank you as your well. help and attention. Okay. Our health director is present. Tony, good to see you. Thank you. All right, Chairman Paisley, Vice Chair Carter, Commissioners. I think we're starting off with a proclamation uh, for Public Health Month. What I really like about uh, Public Health Month uh, coming uh, in the month of April. It usually typically coincides when we're developing our budget, so it gives us an opportunity to not only reflect on what we worked on over the past year, but what we're going to look on in the next year and into the future. So an excellent time to do that. So with that before you is a proclamation, and it reads, Whereas we hereby recognize and acknowledge 83 years of public health service to the residents of Alamance County, as well as the vast contributions of, the, of these services to the quality of our life in our communities, and whereas the American Public Health Association has adopted the theme of building bridges to better health for 2021, recognition of National Public Health Week, and whereas Alamance County Health Department has continued to educate the public, policymakers, and public health professionals about issues important to improving the public's health, and whereas there is significant difference in life expectancy and health status such as obesity, poor mental health, and cancer across socioeconomic regions of the county, and this variance increases due to social determinants that negatively impact health, such as poverty, transportation barriers, and lack of economic opportunity. And whereas public health plays a crucial role in foundations of good health and quality of life, lived by working to immunize people against disease, by working to control environmental health hazards and infectious disease, by improving the health of mothers and children, and promoting health, healthy behaviors in areas of tobacco use, physical activity, and nutrition. And whereas public health professionals help communities prevent, prepare for, withstand, and recover from the impact of a full range of health threats, including, including disease outbreaks such as SARS, COVID, coronavirus, or emerging illness, natural disasters, and disasters caused by human activity. And whereas public health plays a crucial role in eliminating health inequities and preventing chronic disease and injuries resulting in improved productivity and decreased health care costs for all Alamance County residents. And whereas a continued focus on health promotion, disease prevention, and racial, and racial health and environmental quality in Alamance County through collaborative partnerships with a multitude of agencies in the community to find solutions to health issues. And now therefore, before you, the Alamance County Board of County Commissioners to hereby proclaim April 2021 as Public Health Month in Alamance County and call upon the people of Alamance County to observe this month by helping our community better understand the value of public health and supporting great opportunities to adopt preventive lifestyle habits in light of this year's national observance, Building Bridges to Better Health. And we thank you. Board, that needs a motion. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to second. Any further comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, unanimous. Thank you. Awesome. And we have a certificate, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Arms aren't quite long. <laughs> 
inspect a gadget. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and jump into the COVID-19 update. Um, so 30 new cases reported today on a weekly basis. On average right now, we're getting about 37 cases coming in per day. Um, so what we've seen over the last couple of weeks or last time I came before you um, is we really hit this plateau. We had a small bump up and we've just been plateaued out right now. Um, so we're continuing to monitor. Hopefully those numbers will continue to go down. We have had a few deaths. Um, on March 20th, we had some late reporting on the deaths that were carryovers from uh, 2020 and I believe six of them were from 2021 that occurred in January and February um, just for some, some, some late reporting. So. Back when I presented before, I think we were at 240 deaths and we're at 259 deaths today. But for the most part, our case is coming in. Everything has uh, pretty much plateaued. There it is. Our percent positive, um, again, we had a little bit of a uh, bump up. It's about 6%. This is just a snapshot week by week. If we do a rolling average, so Epidemiological wise, we do want to do a rolling average. Average, it's right at five percent. So again, we want to be at that five percent um, or lower uh, number. Same thing for our new cases uh, per one hundred thousand population. Um, Three hundred and five um, cases about per one hundred over a fourteen day st snapshot. Um, that's up from two seventy seven, but for the most part, it's just a little bump up and a continued plateau on those cases coming in. So outbreaks as of March 30th, our um, nursing home facilities are at four. Um, this is down from eight when I previously reported to you a few weeks ago. Residential care facilities at three, and this is down from six uh, when I reported uh, a few weeks ago. Zero congregate living, one correctional facility, and then clusters, we have two child care and one K through 12 school. So all of our senior citizens in nursing homes now have been inoculated correctly or vaccinated? Correct, yes. Um, they, they were vaccinated through a federal program, which CVS and Walgreens did a very aggressive approach. Um, I think they've, they've kind of weaned off, and if there's anybody that goes into those facilities and need it, they can reach out to us and we'll go in that those facility. Those numbers look way vaccinated. down. I'm sorry? Those numbers look way down. Yeah, yeah. In fact, when I get to the um, the last slide, there's a little, little uh, teaser in there oh, okay. on those numbers. So. Tony, has the staff of those facilities been real good about wanting to get the vaccine as well um i don't I mean, know that's still their decision yeah you know? i don't know i don't know as of recent but early on when we were rolling it out to those facilities there was some hesitation by the by the staff so i don't know if i can keep an ear out or ask some of those facilities on how they're doing with their staff folks okay um so this is our deaths to date um for some since Jan or excuse me since january um first of this year total deaths 64 um out of six 1,872 cases, 30 of those deaths um, in long-term care facilities, 60, um, and then the remaining other 34 um, outside of the long-term care facilities. Um, and again, a majority of our deaths have occurred in that, that 65 uh, and older population. So that's about half a percent, just a little over half a percent? Correct. Yeah. Of those infected. Those that's, infected. That's yeah. really not bad. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is the, the vaccination outreach here. We're out, this is as of um, uh, April 1st, I believe, the, the, um, the state site hasn't updated since then, so it'll be exciting to see what's occurred over the last couple of days. So those with uh, live in Alamance County, 44,993 have been partially vaccinated, 27,000, um, close to 28,000 are fully vaccinated. Total population that have been partially vaccinated is right at 26%. If we're just looking at our vaccine population, again, for argument's sake, 18 and older, um, that's right up there in the 35% uh, area. So that's those are pretty good, good numbers. We're more than one third of the way um, there. The health department has um, received 21,885 doses of vaccine, and we've given uh, 21,804 first doses and 15,801 
uh, second doses, and we also have 100 Johnson & Johnson, and I'll get to it where those Johnson & Johnson shots are going here in just a moment. Um, in the top right-hand corner, I know it's hard to see, um, but that's kind of our race Repeat ethnicity. Repeat the numbers of vaccine we received and the numbers that you have given. Repeat um, those two numbers again, please. Sure. So for the first dose, we have received 21,885, and we have administered 21,804. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so our race ethnicity background, I know it's hard to see. For the most part, between white, African American, Native American, Asian, that has remained pretty much unchanged and consistent. Um, a few weeks ago, I mentioned uh, that the Hispanic numbers, or those that I identify as being Hispanic, were very low at 3.3%. 3, 3 um, we've done a very concentrated effort, advertising, newspapers, billboards, um, a whole host of things, as well as working closely with our partners, um, uh, Cone Health and Piedmont Health Services. Uh, this Alamance County, as you were, also became a spoke site um, from the big FEMA site in Guilford, and part of that, if, if um, the, the requirements of that is you really had to target targeted historically marginalized populations. Um, Cone did a very concentrated effort at the uh, the Dream Center. Um, today we're seeing the Hispanic number at 9.9 percent, so that has gone up quite a bit since the last couple of weeks I was before you. Yeah, I'd like to recognize the Coxes. They have done a public service for us and put. They have a Hispanic notification and an English notification on their digital billboard on the interstate. And uh, thank them for their efforts and their support. Have you have you been able to track to see if you detect how many of any of people that have contacted you have contacted you because of seeing it on the billboard? I have, have not, not as yet. And the funny thing is every every morning when I'm driving to work, I'm trying to catch it <laughs> and drive at the same time. So. <laughs> I eight, have not. <laughs> you get eight second flashes. That's about the amount of yeah. time you can watch an item on that billboard, and you get eight second flashes on that, and they give it give it to us once in English and once in Spanish. So, yeah, it's much appreciated for, for them to do that for us. Very much appreciated. I'm just curious: has the Hispanic community been like polled or surveyed or gone into some of their areas to ask what their drawbacks are? Because I mean, I understand that. It's just I'm just curious if, as what that fear is in that population because not every not every population so to speak is they're not way one's way up one's way down i'm just curious as to what that drawback is yeah there was an organization and i'm drawing a blank on the name out of raleigh that did a, a poll amongst mm -hmm. hispanics that had covered alamance county forsyth county guilford all the surrounding counties um the biggest i'm, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip here so don't okay. hold me from the numbers there's around 70 80 percent um those polled said the reason they haven't received their shot at the time and the poll was probably about a little over a month ago is because they didn't know of the resources available didn't know where to go uh to set an appointment or to um uh, go go and get their shot basically so, so it was just marketing. it was less an aware, awareness so that's why we it was a huge marketing push not yeah. only from us but the state and other other areas yeah okay yeah um, As so for that matter, I might indicate that one of my paralegals is Hispanic, and uh, you didn't personally give her the vaccine, but I know she's accomplished that. So yes, and I think uh, she and others in our community are promoting vaccines not only for Hispanics but for everyone. Thank you. That's wonderful. Awesome. And uh, also, we might want to make a note too. You can still drive up to the facility and and. Uh, at Eric Lane and somebody will come out and give you the shot if you can't get in because I've mm -hmm. got a friend that just that came up with and they contacted yeah. you and they, those arrangements are being made for a wife who can't get out of the car right now so that's correct yeah if mobility is a challenge and and um, we do have wheelchairs on site but even for some folks sitting in wheelchairs for, for an amount of time can be difficult or even getting from point A to point B inside alone um, but we will come out to your car and vaccinate you in the car absolutely um, so we're currently serving uh, vaccine groups one through five, so that is all individuals 16 and older are now eligible to receive um, their vaccine. So here's the, the good news is we have a lot more providers in the community. We have a lot more vaccine um, out there. We've seen it in our, not only in our appointments at the uh, Alamance County, um, both being us and, and, and the other providers that are out there, but even surrounding counties that uh, there's a lot of choice and a lot of options for folks, so a lot of appointment times, a lot of different uh, for folks to, if they want a certain vaccine. So there's a lot more options out there, but the, uh, we do still encourage you that uh, no matter what, if there's an appointment available, please just get your shot regardless of what the <laughs> vaccine is. Um, 
but there's a lot more choice out there so we're seeing a little bit more slowdown not only in our online but our phone phone appointment scheduling as well and then as i mentioned we did receive johnson and johnson last week 100 doses hopefully we'll get some more in the future um, and then on thursday we'll actually start for those that want it in the detention center using johnson and johnson uh, migrant workers in the uh, end of april when they um, start coming in and then any homebound folks that way we can just be one and done and, and get those folks vaccinated so that's where that will be applied to um, testing is ongoing and continues for the month of April by Optum, who's um, uh, contacted by the contract by the state to uh, do the testing here in Alamance County as well as other providers that uh, do it in the county as well. And here is the last slide. Um, this one's pretty cool. So uh, it might be hard to see, hopefully not too difficult. When we look at January, so January 1st to 131, the amount of cases that came in at that time, those that were 65 and older were 18% of our cases. Fast forward to March, all the way up to March 28th, it's down to now 7.78 or 7.79% of our cases. So wow, a very significant wonderful. drop in 65 and older. Ironically, at the same time, you see an increase in cases from 18 to 49 um, occurring, but they're now in the vaccination group. So. Um, we'll get those folks vaccinated and, and reduce those cases as well. And that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Just one thing. I remember whenever we were first trying to get the vaccine, oh, everybody was frustrated, livid. I mean, it was like the gold rush to California. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I understand panic and fear because that's very part of this um, virus. Are you seeing it just kind of dying down? Not because we hadn't vaccinated everybody, but just because that initial ah is kind of like well they got theirs that's fine i mean what's the mindset of this going on because we're not people aren't just bailing now you know what i'm saying yeah so we still see high demand okay. which is good um, but we do a, see a slowdown in in the amount of, I mean, it used to be as soon as appointments popped up they were gone within right. hours but now like i said people can actually shop around and they're, they are shopping sure. around for better appointment times or um, you know closer locations whatever it might be um, so they have the option to do so and so we've seen a slowdown we're going to monitor it over the next two weeks and really see where it goes and try to understand it and of course adjust our operations as need be as, um, if it truly does continue okay. to decline wow. yeah. okay. thank you thank you thank you Tony thank you next item up uh, may take a few minutes and uh, it's been requested that we have a short recess. We're going to take a 10 minute recess. Thank you. You're a good mic. Okay, we're back in session. Okay, um, Susan Evans, you're up next. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Before you this morning is a resolution for you to review and consider to, that which will authorize the issuance of the bonds in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $173,760,000. These bonds will finance construction and renovation projects at Alamance Burlington School System in the amount of $150 million, as well as Alamance Community College in the amount of $23,760,000. So at this time, Commissioner Paisley, I'll ask that you introduce the resolution by reading the title. Do we want to have discussion on this before? This is we just to introduce the motion, I mean the resolution, and then you're able to have all of the discussion that you want. Right, thank you. Resolution, I move that we approve the resolution authorizing the issuance of the general obligation public improvement with bonds series 2021 second right, now we will have the discussion and i uh, i know that a number of us have discussed a lot of issues over the weekend even uh, there's been a lot of change in everything even including the the uh, uh, economy and so forth and all kinds of other issues um, well I want to just say I, I know we've all been thinking about it and I've had a lot of calls about it and I, I actually woke up at four o'clock yesterday morning thinking about these bonds 
I know that we have, uh, according to uh, what I've heard from ABSS, about $77 million coming into ABSS from the uh, COVID money from last year. We have money, but we don't know exactly how much yet coming to ACC. We have around $33 million, I believe it is, coming to Alamance County. We don't have directions yet on exactly how we're going to be able to spend all that money. Um, it appears that some of it can be used for infrastructure. Uh, obviously, the ABSS money can be used in, in some fashion for schools. Um, some of them may be some of the issues we're looking at with uh, some of the premium needs for HVAC things or HVAC issues and so forth that we've been discussing in our tours. And uh, I'm, I'm really wondering about the timing of issuing these bonds. If we have a, if we, if we're floating in money around here and we've issued bonds which we can't prepay for a 10 year period of time, then are we going to be sitting here with money we can't spend or have to re refund to the government if we don't spend it? And bond money that we borrowed and put on the backs of our citizens, it just doesn't sound like the right mix. I think we need to take a little bit more time to make this decision. And I'm asking a question right now of our Davenport representative. What are the issues around how much longer can we wait and to, to issue the bonds? Or what, are, what are the ramifications? I know we're facing the possibility of losing a premium and of course we're getting citizens calling us that are saying they don't want us to take the premium we just have one speak this morning i personally think the premium is a good idea and i've had some conversations with uh mr lashley and uh he's explained the premium issue to me it sounds a little bit like interest-free money am i right close close um like i said a little like um but there are a lot of issues going on that we don't know the answers to yet. Um, and I know we have a lot of needs at the same time, so. I'll, I'll try to, uh, the, Ted Cole with Davenport, I'll try to answer a few of the questions or points that were raised. Um, the bonds are scheduled to sell on April 20th, and that's a date that we, we, we got from the Local Government Commission. Um, we can go back to them and ask for a different sale date later um, into um, probably June or July at this point, I think. May is April and May are pretty well full. Maybe into June or July would be the next opportunity. Um, so that is something you all certainly could decide to do. Um, we may need to you know, update some documents here or there in the bond rating process, but nothing insurmountable. Um, and you had mentioned um, the 10-year no prepayment language. That is typical when we sell general right. obligation bonds to the bond market, 10-year no prepayment. So in other words, the, the investors that buy those know that they have 10 years before the bonds can be what we refer to as called or prepaid. You might want to refinance these bonds in the future. Right. Even though we're in a very low interest rate environment today, there could be an opportunity to refinance it in the future or pay them down more quickly. Under the normal process for selling these bonds, you would be precluded from doing that for 10 years. We could certainly explore if there's some portion of these bonds that you might want to sell with a shorter no prepayment period, a five-year no prepayment period, but generally the, the, uh, the typical approach would be no prepayment for 10 years, but there um, certainly could be another strategy for some amount of this money if you wanted to consider a shorter no prepayment period. Um, if there was another, I, th well, I think that kind of covers. You're saying possibly we can look at moving the issue date down to sometime in June. Hopefully we will get some direction from the feds on what we can use this money that we're getting for and then make some decisions about how to use it between ABSS. The problem is I know it delays some of the needs that ABSS is working on and the movement on the new high school. Um, yeah, and I can, I, when I get back to my seat, I can tell you what, when I think I keep a calendar of when the, the rescheduled date might be available. Okay. But that is certainly an option. 
um, you know, you could downsize the transaction if that plays into your thinking for one reason or another. Um, you know, I, I'm here throughout the discussion. I don't know if you'd like Mr. to stay Hager, here. Do we now. have any idea at all when and if these federal funds will be available to uh, the Amlets Burlington School System and or ACC? Uh, no, I know the county government has been told that you could expect the first half of our $33 million allocation within 60 days of the law being signed into effect. And I know that uh, the National Association of Counties has sent a pretty detailed list of requests to Treasury to try to say these are the concerns they're hearing from counties. A lot of it is about capital and uses of money wanting uh, the Treasury to try to give county governments at least, um, some very specific rules up front uh, and right. rules that they wouldn't change, you know, as you get into spending the money. I'm not as familiar with uh, what you might be able to expect from the funding that's going to be provided to the school system or to the community college. I'd be speculating if I told you I had any real idea <laughs> what their uses might be. I think it will probably, if I was going to guess, it will be some of the same questions. Can the money be used for capital? Uh, you know, what will the rules be on the money? and I'm sure the school system and the community college would also be like county government. We're going to want rules that are set and not tweak too much once they're given to us so we know we feel comfortable spending the money the way that we choose to do. So, I don't know. If we have Dr. Gatewood with us. I believe we also have Dr. Benson on the Zoom call. So. And before we do that, can you explain to this board the difference between capital funding and maintenance? So I know from county government's perspective, capital funding is usually a dollar amount uh, that starts coming into play. I think it's more than 25. When we get into projects that are usually greater than $25,000, we start thinking of those as capital. Uh, and as opposed to routine, ongoing, might, maybe not as planned type of expenditures. If something breaks, those are your, your maintenance, right? Something has broken, you have a pot of money and you say, we're gonna go fix that item versus a planned project. Uh, usually we think of capital being more planned. All right, I guess really where I'm headed with that, the new school will have approximately $1.7 million worth of maintenance that we'll have to allocate per year if the numbers I've seen are, are, are I correct. I thought it was over two. Uh, I think you, talk, you may be talking about the operating costs. Operating, 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 operating costs. Cost. Uh, uh, the scenarios we provided the board, uh, we feel pretty comfortable that those operating costs could fall into the capital plan and be covered uh, when the new high school opens. That wasn't the original intent, but uh, you know, with uh, our sales tax revenue, our tax base growth, and the interest rates that we've been looking at so far, we think oper the operating costs of the new high school and the operating costs of the new facilities for um, the community college would fit into the capital plan too. So. I guess really where I'm headed with that is, how easy is it going to be for the MS Mervinton school system to shift money around without our authorization from capital to maintenance, for example, or or the other way around? Uh, so, you know, in our in our capital plan, we provide them uh, 3.3 million dollars a year, and that's primarily for their if something breaks, uh, they fix it or small scale plan projects. I think uh, Dr. Thorpe's talked about things like mulch for playgrounds. Uh, smaller cost items. If they had a, uh, if you had one of the bond projects that came in over cost, right, because they're getting their bids right now and they projected what they think those uh, costs are going to be. If they had a project that maybe had a change order and you didn't uh, want to authorize the use of capital reserves or if you take the bonds and take any bond premiums, um, you, you could possibly use uh, CIP monies to do that too, uh, to, to cover the bond project over cost. I think that'd probably be the last resort. Uh, if you had capital reserves, I'm sure the schools would prefer to use that than their CIP money. Well, I know there's some things that we've, we've got in motion that the thing is, we there's possibly some of this money that can even, I mean, it, there's $300 billion is what I saw online this weekend that is allocated for I didn't understand the breakdown that was allocated for upfitting homes and new homes. We did, it wasn't clear who for, and for schools, for upfitting schools and for new school construction. So we don't know how much of that Alamance County might get. That's not even approved yet. That's a suggested infrastructure bill. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is some of this stuff we probably need to get in motion, but how much time do we have to 
make a decision about changing about what has to be started right now based on what we've already got in motion if, if we if we had that information presented to us at our meeting on the 19th that's obviously the day before the issuance date I don't know if we can make a decision that late I don't think we can it, but, it would, that would be very very tight uh, to try to do it then and if you're if the commissioners are asking if we'll have guidance from the feds from Treasury for either the county dollars or the school or community college the rules for how their money can be spent by the 19th uh -huh. I would be skeptical that we will have that I, I, I can guarantee do. it it's possible mm -hmm. but uh, I think um, NACO has hoped uh, and I'm, I'm, that maybe in May we would have some idea of rules and that might be kind of a, a guess too it, I mean at some point the county the school system and the college will have guidance from the treasury about how to spend the money and again the hope will be it's very firm not something they'll change you know three four months later so i'd have a question for dr gatewood and for dr benson uh how job ready to borrow a term <laughs> uh, are these projects how much will not approving this uh, this matter today hold up progress so in our case um, Mr. Chairman, it would hold up progress. We have the CM at risk and the architect that has been working, and we have them scheduled. Uh, they're pretty much ready to go on the Valtech Center of Excellence building. <coughs> and it's the architect's been doing a lot of work on the student services building. They are effectively ready to go too. I don't know how long they will hang out and not move on to another job. Exactly. Waiting on us, that, that could be a problem. And if I may, sir, I do want to um, make you aware that whatever the community college gets from the federal care that correct or whatever it's called, the federal fund for COVID-19, would definitely pale in comparison to what the county is expected to get and what the public schools are expected to get. Moreover, heretofore, we've gotten other allocations of federal COVID funds, and we have been um, instructed, uh, and that we have to do this, to make sure that a certain amount of that really goes directly to students. So we just, it's flowing through the college. Now, there are funds that we have received that are what we call institutional funds and we have some say over but then there are guidelines with those two and it's been our understanding and i and understand my colleagues across the state that at least the funds that we've re received at this point um, sh probably should not be used for capital projects and dr thorpe and dr benson i would open up discussion <coughs> excuse me the discussion uh, to you folks on how this our not passing it today would hold you up right now you got uh, uh, I want the doctor to speak more just <laughs> I do know that behind, you kind of stay, you stay behind years. Um, and I do want to speak just a little bit about the COVID uh, funding that we have available. We have, to, we have general guidelines as to how that money can be, can be spent. And as Dr. Gatewood said, a, a good portion of it needs to be directed to provide support for, for students. And 20% uh, of that amount needs to go directly to um, supporting students from remediation, helping to, to make up for for learning loss. It is permissible to use some of the funds to do things like improve HVAC ventilation systems, things that would, that would slow the spread of any potential uh, virus in a classroom or, or school uh, setting. But I would like Dr. Thorpe just to, to weigh in a little bit about the, the, the time and our ability to execute. I know that we've um, started to move forward with locking in the uh, steel packages um, uh, that's something that we've talked about before being a, um, a little bit over what we had anticipated but also the availability of, of being able to lock into that steel package and then getting a uh, preliminary surveying going on the, on the sites but uh, I would ask Dr. Thorpe to, uh, to add to that. Okay, eight of, eight of the nine projects are, have been bid, so we have bids locked in at this point so we know what our bids are for these projects. 
We also know the escalating costs, so if we, we have to cancel these bids uh, because of the timing. Uh, they won't hold them up typically four to six weeks, and most of them have been held for several weeks now. So we would have to cancel bids and go back out to bid unless there would be a contract to be willing to keep those bids. That's a risk you run. When it goes back out, you could see inflated costs, especially with the escalation of materials and labor going up right now, as well as timing. Uh, with the new high school, we've been very precise in timing that to come on board at the beginning of the summer 2023, so we can be in it by August of 2023. Uh, otherwise, you get a high school in October, you really can't do anything <laughs> and see, well, with the, the, the true redistricting of how we're having to redistrict to it, that building was set vacant more than likely for a year, which is terrible on the building's sake because you wouldn't want to jerk someone up that's been at Southern High School for seven weeks and stick them in a new building and have to learn the whole new building. Uh, you could possibly do it at a uh, semester change uh, if the school board so chose to do that. I think the biggest thing we run into is we do have the bids in hand. They will be, can you know, more than likely they will be canceled. We run a risk of really getting some good numbers to people knowing what the numbers are now for sure, and those numbers come back inflated. Uh, so but that's where we stand at. You know, our other projects, not in New High School, but it's very critical that Eastern, Western, Southern, Graham and William, Graham and Cummins and Williams all come on at the same time. That way with the redistricting plan, everybody's moved once, it's done. We're not jerking kids up, moving them from this place to this place to this place. Well, I have to admit, I was, when I was speaking, I, saw, I was looking at your face and I saw your face change color <laughs> and, 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 and demeanor. But when I said what I said, so I, I understood when I said what I said that I was really gonna be throwing you a curveball, and uh, I apologize for that. Well, I but I, this for you. this <laughs> has really been causing me some consternation, and I felt if I didn't raise the issue, I think we the, didn't think about it. The biggest thing is everything we're hearing with the COVID money. It does, like I said, a large portion of it goes back to students and programs, mental health, uh, remediation services. But it's been pretty clear throughout everything. You can use it for the prevention of COVID nineteen, as well as talking about your HVAC systems, talking about. Uh, fresh air, internet, uh, it doesn't really get into some of the areas I talked about even with Linda's and stuff such as that, you know, code may make you do that, but it's, it's very clear in what we can use it for in facilities right now. Now we all know that could change in the next, it can be changing while we're sitting here today. And we know how long it takes to get a bill through for a $2 trillion project too, right. so <laughs> right. um, I don't know would indicate that all five board members um, and all the folks sitting here probably already know this, but folks out in TV land or wherever don't know this, all five board members uh, had a wonderful visit with ACC and with the Alabama Burlington School System on Wednesday of this past week. Uh, we witnessed uh, firsthand the uh, ventilation, the air conditioning, the heating, the HVAC issues and so forth, and they are tremendous. And thank goodness that some of this federal money will help alleviate some of those issues with both systems. Um, board, I understand the issues, I understand, but I'm gonna encourage us to pass this. Mr. Lashley, you, I, uh, by the way, Mr. Lashley did a lot of study and provided a lot of information to all of us board members uh, regarding just what uh, premiums are and all kinds of issues of that sort. So, and we're very, very appreciative. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm glad I could help. I just hope I did. Uh, I actually have a lot of questions, but I'm just gonna start from the simplest question to the hardest. And Mr. Davenport, you were the hardest. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Gatewood, you mentioned the Biotechnology Center of Excellence. Uh, is what you need the money right uh, now. Biotech, student services, okay. those are kind of ready to go. Ready to go. The reason I ask is I saw some, um, we had mentioned before, we had talked before about maybe going to the, had an idea of maybe going to the bond market and getting this money together. Had spoke to Ms. Evans about maybe doing something short term to alleviate the what we will pay on the bond. Um, but if uh, the 17, 1756 for the biotechnology center. You say you need that now, it's imperative going forward. Understood. Uh, 
And thank you for that. Uh, and uh, Mr. Thorpe, uh, you say you have eight of the nine projects that we have here in front of us that are bidded, ready to go, and you were concerned that those bids could be dropped and you'd be back to square one. Correct. Understood that too. Uh, Mr. Davenport, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Mr. Cole yes. from uh, Davenport, uh, I would like for you to take your best swing and explain to this board and to the folks watching today what is premium and does it have to be paid back? Mr. Lashley, Mr. Chairman, if I may, while he's coming forward, 17.6 for the biotech building, 6.2 for the student service. Right. right. And I know you have some stuff later on. Yes. And I'll, 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 after I speak yes. with him, Thank I you. want to revert back to that and ask you another question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gatewood. All right. Um, <laughs> bond premium is, as I've explained, I think, and discussed with you all, is not unique to Alamance County. It's not unique to, um, to this particular bond issue for you all. It is a function of selling bonds into what we call the public bond market, which is what you all are planning to do, as opposed to getting a loan from a bank. So because we're going to the bond market, um, the likelihood of getting a, this premium is is very high in fact we ran numbers late last week and we were seeing for the 150 million of abss um premium that could be around 20 million okay it's going back up a little bit then right um and then and then the community college maybe three million so combined about 23 million at premium you cannot establish bidding parameters for these bonds think about think about it this way on april 20th if we stick with that date underwriting firms are going to be bidding on purchasing these bonds from you and they in turn turn around and sell it to investors so the underwriters um, are the people bidding on your bonds and then ultimately the bonds end up in the hands of of individual or or um, you know corporate investors um, and if you try to restrict the bidding parameters such that you don't get the premium, I believe you run two risks. One, higher costs of interest than you would normally get, and or maybe some people that just don't participate. So you can't really control not getting the premium. That premium structure is going to occur. How much exactly, we won't know till the day of the sale. So the premium is a foregone conclusion in my mind. What you control is the PAR, P-A-R, amount of the bonds you're selling. And let's stick with ABSS because it's a round number, 150 million. In our estimate, if you sell $150 million worth of these bonds, you're going to receive, I'm going to round up, about $170 million if you took the premium. You don't have to take that premium. You can downsize the 150 million to approximately 130 million and land with 150 million dollars for your projects. You're still taking the premium. Premium doesn't go away. The way you control it is you downsize the par amount of the bonds you're selling to land on a particular dollar amount that you want. When would that election be required to be made? The morning of April 20th. And the documents, normally, the documents that go out to the bidders, to the investing public say, we're selling 150 million of par amount, but we reserve the right to adjust that amount down depending on the outcome of the premium. Or we reserve, you know, we, we, we may not. If we want all that premium, we sell 150, and we get 170. If we want 160, we adjust halfway. If we if we only want 150 out of that, we adjust all the way down to, to land on 150. Which means you have, in, in a term used in the, the board presentation, you have banked or unissued general obligation bonds. So if you sell 150 and you could get 170, but you don't want that much. You downsize it, let's say, to 130, 
So you, you end up with the 150, but you only sold $130 million of bonds. You have $20 million of ABSS bonds that the voters authorized, but you have not issued that you could choose to issue in the future or not. So, uh, and so premium is real money that comes to the county for projects, and yes, you have to pay it back. It is, it is you, not free money. Can you say that again? It is real money <laughs> that comes to the county for project costs, and you have to pay it back. The pre it, premium's not free money. They're not giving you 174, and you pay back 150. That doesn't work <laughs> right. in this system. There's a lot of folks who believe that, Mr. Cole. Right. That's why I'm glad yeah, that you when you say when that. you look at the debt service schedules of selling the 150 and taking the premium versus selling the 150 and not taking the premium there is an absolute difference in the debt service schedule so yes there's there it is it will if you take the premium you will have a higher debt service schedule for 20 years than you would if you did not take the premium yeah, and that's that's Mr. based excuse so i'm sorry go ahead steve i was just going to say that's based solely because you're netting the uh the coupon rate versus the amortized premium, correct? That's where the yield comes from. Okay. That's right, yeah. And a question for Mr. Haygood. As I understand it, the budget that we have for this capital projects, the debt service with the premium would be equivalent to the debt service we budgeted for for the $150 million, am I correct? I'm, would you restate that? I'm sorry, I want to make sure I answer it correctly. Okay. The debt service, as the interest rates have changed from when we originally planned $150 million in bonds to where we are today, the debt service would, equi would be equivalent to what it would have been on the 150 before with the premium. And Susan, I think I see nodding semi-yes. <laughs> yeah, because there you are stopped about halfway down. <laughs> right, because there are changing factors. Um, with that lower interest rate, it's not changing the principal amount right. of 150. Um, it would change within that interest rate and the plan that we have because of the conservative estimates that we took would cover that. And Ted, you can correct me if I'm wrong. In that's right. No, the the if if you were to based on current market, if you were to choose to sell the 150 and take the premium, which again we know we have to pay that back, um, the annual payment and the total payment over 20 years of doing that is less than the planning interest rate and debt service we had in the model. Right. So we're we're still coming in lower. Yep. And it and and and. Mr. Lashley shared a, a very interesting uh, uh, sketch with me. Very simple. I could have handled it a little bit more complex Bigger? than yeah. that, but it was very simple on a $100 bond, which I thought was really interesting and I've shared with a couple of people. Looked at a $100 bond with a $2 premium and a 3% interest rate. The payback at the end of 12 months, I think you said on that, would have been $105. 3% interest on the $100 would be $3 and two dollars you pay back which looks like you get the bond holder the person who bought the bond with his coupon is getting his premium payment back amateur one for one amateur and his principal plus his interest yep so uh, the, what i think with the biggest confusion with the with the uh, premium was folks thought that the premiums coming to them and it's stuff they don't have to pay back and it's not and all I was trying to show them that you have to amortize that premium right. over the length of the bond, right. and that is it. And, and there's a it's available when you buy a bond, you're going to get an amortized premium schedule. You're going to see it. It's going to see how much are you getting this premium back every year. You get a little bit back. Yeah, so and the premium folks, will be accounted for in the in the audit right. as well. Exactly. The bondholder is only paying taxes on the interest that he's earned. That's he doesn't it. pay taxes on the premium. Uh, the, uh, these these investors aren't paying any taxes. Well, that's true. That's true. This, this is tax free. free. Mm -hmm. So this is why the yield is going to be extremely important to them. So are we going to do, are we borrowing 150 or are we borrowing 174? I believe that's the prudent way to go. Uh, Mr. Cole said that we can actually borrow less money, use the premium to get to the 150 number that we need. 
Uh, we also need to make sure that Mr. Gatewood gets his 23.6 in that offering. I will uh, make a different comment than I made the last meeting after doing some work and doing some math. And after the discussion I um, talked to Ms. Evans about, I believe that we probably should hold off. This is my personal opinion. Uh, I think we should probably hold off on the 2022 bonds for ACC. I don't believe that we can recoup enough money from the short-term rates that me and Ms. Evans were talking about to recoup the money that we, by law, thanks for your email, by law we can't go out and get 2% from the bond market and take it out to the oil right. market and make 20%. It's against the law. But we can take and go and get short-term rates for holding the money for ACC. Well, after doing my homework, I truly believe we can wait until 2022 and it'll be a wash. If I was to get that money right now, use the short-term rates to offset my expenses, I still think it's gonna cost me a half to three quarters of 1%, and a half or three quarters of 1% on $25 million is way too much. I don't know if I don't have any other way to recoup that loss. Right. So, if, and rather than carrying that loss forward for two years, I'll take my chances with the pond market in two years or 18 months and see if maybe if they won't uh, take it easy on us, so to speak. But you're not talking about the money today. No, the money today I think we should get. Right. Uh, I think uh, the interest rate on uh, the 20th will be favorable to us compared to the projections that we have. Uh, I, I really think we have to. We have to. We have to transact on, so on that day should, at least a little bit. Yeah. You think we should take the net 150? Uh, I want to take the exact amount that the taxpayers right. and voters told me the they The net wanted. 150. I want 150. That leaves, I want 20, leaves approximately $20 million in unissued bonds that we can issue in the future. In the 2022. As, and that, you know, thinking about it from the perspective of the federal money coming in, that gives us a chance then to see how much of that federal money can cover some of these projects. Right. And then figure out how much of that 20 million we actually need to issue. Yep. I think it's much more prudent for us to. But the kick in the pants is, Commissioner Carter, is you know if we get a favorable issue oh, yeah. with the government, we can't pay these bonds off. We can't actually do ourselves a favor because we have 10-year can't pay. Right? That's right. Now that's assuming we get a premium. Um, on the 150. Mr. Cole has told us we're getting. I think a premium. you will get a premium. Exactly how much to be determined. Yes. Right? It could be 130 par and it could be 20 in the premium but I'm glad Mr. Cole said that and I want everyone to say it to themselves <laughs> premium has to be paid back it's not a gift and the bond markets don't give gifts they like to take gifts oh yeah so, uh, they don't but I'm glad I know this is a very not a single one of us who wants to go out and invest and give money and not, and not get it back oh no <laughs> so are you saying that you're not gonna make Todd have a heart attack no Todd's good Okay. Todd and Mr. Gatewood, as far as I'm concerned, I think we need to go to the bond market on the 20th and get what we have that we're going to get. I initially said I thought I wanted to go get that money for 2022 now, but I don't think it's going to be advent. I, don't, I think there's no gain to doing that. I think I could probably just wait, I see what the bond market rates are going to be. I'll bet, I'll bet you some cash that it's going to be higher, but it's not going to be outrageous. It's not going to be a half percent. But if it if it does, at least I got a little bit of an idea that the federal government's going to dump some money on us, and we can sort of sift it out and see where we land on the second issuance of that right. bond. I just didn't want to carry those two years of $27 million at a half percent because there was no way I could recoup it. Now, if there was some way I could hedge myself, I would do it, but we don't. the only way I could do that is raise taxes on the adult. I can't do that. So um, I think it was probably just... If I had to, if this was my baby, I would go get my 150 for the folks and ACC and go back to the bond market when it's time. So that's going to take us to about 130 and about 17. Is that correct? So about 147, 148? We'll, we'll, we'll be right on it. I mean, when, the, when uh, Mr. Cole gives the, the bond traders uh, this order, they are going to be able to do the math and know what right. the interest rates are right I'm just there. thinking about a resolution. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. The resolution does not have to change because the resolution is setting the maximum. Mm -hmm. 
that would okay. be yes. if you, if you, in yeah. principle. Okay. So your resolution does not need to change. Our, our next item, if you vote to issue, if you vote to approve this resolution and issue uh, the maximum of 150 and 39.6, or I think it was 23, um, 23 right. uh, for the for the college. Then our next item, that's what I want to hear from you is do you want, it sounds like the board is interested in uh, netting the 150 million for the school system. I will want to hear from the commissioners how you want to treat the community colleges debt. If you get a premium, do you want to take it in additional cash or do you want to do the same thing you're talking about with the um, school system where you don't take the full 23,760? You uh, reduce that par by whatever premium we might have gotten. But that's the next item. Really, the main thing right now is are you interested in issuing this debt? So uh, we need here. a resolution to approve, or we need a vote. To, uh, or a motion to approve the resolution. We already have that thought, do we not? No, we don't. Not, have, we haven't made the motion yet. I'll make a motion. Well, can I ask just a question? Sure. sure before sure. we do this, uh, you know, we've heard about all the COVID money mm -hmm. that the schools. I mean, this astronomical amount could be through so many oh, years ahead. Blah blah blah. But not one dime of that money has anything to do with brick, cement, roofing. Mm -hmm. Toilets, anything that you build a school. If you're going to put plastic things in between students, or you're going to get all new air conditions where it's not the windows open that's blowing your hair, it's the real vents. Stuff like that is totally pertained to COVID and COVID prevention, even though COVID's on the way out. And I mean, so it's cut this CARES money isn't going to re roof. Sylvan, it's not going to do any of that. That's what a bond for capital building, add ons, blah, blah, blah. That's what this bond is designed to do. So if we're waiting for some little man in a cubicle somewhere in Washington, D.C., to all of a sudden get all warm and fuzzy and say, oh, we're going to give all this money to even to Azalea Bushes, it, it's not going to happen. And uh, so I don't, I, you know, I, I want to do exactly what the taxpayers voted. That is, that is all I'm here to say because I voted. That's what it is. But I don't want ABSS to get screwed over anything. I don't want, I don't want no tennis courts to be removed from that high school because that was big on me. If you're going to build it, build it right. <laughs> You know, and I mean, we've been in schools, and I promise you, I went in Williams, and if you'd have went in Williams a couple of years ago, you might have voted for another hundred million because it was a hot mess. That's right. And it's still got some messes in it. And um, as I've been in these schools, I got pictures on my phone. You have no idea. And I mean, I was <laughs> all about that. Just go big or go home when it comes to doing things right because you won't want your children walking in and looking out a window that's got black around the edge and it's not been painted it's mold you breathe that mess you know i'm sitting here with a flipping mask on i mean come <laughs> on so i mean windows that turn time or there's so many needs and they need to be fixed they need to be fixed and uh, removing one thing to fix another that's just not how you don't run your business that way we can't run the lives of young people that way so I know this is more money than I'll ever make in my lifetime unless I get that one lottery ticket, which ain't gonna happen. But I just, I just don't want to see, I don't want to see us. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I just want this done right by our kids, because kids have been waiting for a long time. I mean, I know what these buildings have looked like. We saw stuff that looked like the Titanic engine over there at <laughs> Hall River, and the the cements like this. I mean. It has to be an inch and a half before it's considered a fall risk. No, that's crazy. That's like somebody saying, well, your roaches aren't that big in your house. They're still there. So um, I don't know, guys. We, we just got to see the big picture here and make sure we just do right by everybody. But the taxpayers voted on one thing, and that that that's we got to honor that. Because if we don't honor that, they will never trust us again. And I don't blame them. And Mr. Turner, I think uh, I yes, Mr. Chairman, just a couple questions. Commissioner Thompson mentioned the COVID funding for the schools. Dr. Benson, the, the school system is going to get seventy-seven million, around seventy-seven million for its um, federal COVID funding. Is that right? Uh, yes, in, in three waves, and uh, right. we believe the rules will be the same for all three of the waves. And we know that the guidance is not there yet. Just like the guidance for the county's money is not there yet, but we know at least that. Some of the money can be used to fund HVAC improvements. Is that right? That that is our understanding. The the, the little bit of guidance that we have received formally indicates that uh, 
improving environmental conditions in our buildings to slow the spread of, of virus would be an acceptable uh, expense. And Dr. Thorpe, when you and I spoke at the last meeting, we talked that there was, you, you could identify about $50 million of improvements that the schools would need on top of the 150 that the bond money is providing, right? But a large portion of that was HVAC funding. I think in your budget there was between 10 and 20 million dollars of HVAC improvements that the schools need. Mm -hmm. So it's at least possible that the COVID money or a portion of the COVID money that's designated for the schools could cover HVAC improvements mm -hmm. that are in your budget that we may not have to use um, premium for in the future. That's at least possible. Is that, is that fair? Um, Mr. Cole, what are the, um, if we elect not if we elect to get $150 million and bank, as, as you said, bank the right to get an additional $20 million in premium at a later time, when does that money need to be allocated? Uh, I, when, when I use the term bank, I think, let me just clarify, that would mean you, you have left some of the ABSS bonds unissued. Right. And so you would reserve the right to go back to the bond market with a new bond issue for that remaining 20 million at whatever the rate would be at that time. And um, initially, your right to sell those bonds would expire seven years after the referendum date, which... Uh, November of 2018. So... so if, if you don't years. yeah if you don't take the premium and you downsize if you don't take all the premium and you downsize the transaction leaving 20 million of ABSS bonds out there it's what we call authorized by the voters but unissued there is no money sitting anywhere that you pull down you issue a issue those at the future uh, within seven years of the November of 18 date, and you can usually get a three-year extension from the local government commission. So seven to ten years. And when you, if you choose to issue that premium that, that you have banked the right to reserve, mm -hmm. uh, can you get premium on top of that? Depends on the market environment at that time. Whenever you decide to go ahead and sell that $20 million, whether we're in a low rate or high rate, will determine if you get a premium and how much. Thank you. And there was another issue with the premium too. If we took, if we were to take the hundred and seventy-three million dollars, twenty-three million in premium, then we have to spend that money within three years. I think you said. Correct? I think the the rule is that you have a reasonable expectation that it can be spent within a three-year period. Okay. And then, Mr. Hager, this is my last series of questions. There are already baked into our plan different dates over the next two years when we are scheduled to issue either ABSS or ACC bond debt, right? That's correct. Do you know when those are? So uh, th there are no, at this time, there are no additional uh, issuances of ABSS debt. Right? So right. this would be all right. of their original projects. Right. The next issuance for the community college, I believe, is September of 22, yes, as sir. Commissioner Lashley mentioned. and. Uh, Looking here, I believe that might be their final. Mm -hmm. I believe that is their final issuance. So, this issuance for ABS, uh, excuse me, ACC would be twenty-three million seven hundred sixty dollars up to up to that amount of principal, no more. Then the the second issuance in September of twenty-two uh, would be for up to fifteen million eight hundred and forty thousand dollars for the community college projects only. Both of those added together, where you get your thirty-nine point six million maximum amount approved by the voters in 18. Is there not another issuance for ACC in, in 21? I thought that there were, I thought there were a total of three issuances from ACC. So One the, later this year, maybe September of this year? Uh, so it, it, mm -hmm. uh, we've got the Biotech Center of Excellence April of 21, which would be April 20th. We have the Student Service Center also April of 21. And then we have the Public Safety Training Center in September of 22, ah, the Instructional Space Child Care uh, Renovation September of 22, and then both satellites are September of 22. Okay, so, so I misunderstood that. We're able to combine those two projects. That's right. The, if you the board remember, the LGC allowed us, the board seemed to be interested in the possibility of issuing um, the Center of Excellence and the Safe, uh, Student Services Center at the same time. We, that was not our original plan, but we have moved those two up 
LGC has blessed that even though we don't have those bids in hand. Uh, but the idea, I think, at our last meeting was there was some interest in taking advantage of the current market, the current interest rates, if we can do it now. So, okay. so we've been blessed to do so. Is there anything set in stone about the September 22 date? If we wanted to move, if ACC wanted to move that up or move it back, could we? Is there anything set in stone? The, uh, the one thing I would say is what we've seen with this plan and model is if you, if you move things backwards, they tend to stay affordable, right? We, we've balanced all our payments when they come due. If, I, I would want to run numbers if you move it up. If you wanted to issue uh, the, the debt for the community college earlier than September of 22, right. I want to rerun this and, and get with uh, Davenport. It may fit within the plan as it's funded right now. I know it will fit. I feel very confident it will fit if you move backwards. Right. If you issued it, you know, December of 22 or, or sometime in 23, I feel pretty confident it will, it will fit. And the reason I ask that question is that because I understand from Mr. Cole, it makes sense that if you are issuing um, both ABSS debt and ACC debt at the same time, that there are cost savings for doing that. Mm -hmm. So if we have another issuance in the future, and if we, if we get to the point where we want to issue premium for for ABSS because the federal funding didn't come in as, as we thought it might or because there are additional projects that, that through Dr. Thorpe and Dr. Benson that the board thinks that we need to approve. Um, it would make sense to issue that at the same time as the ACC debt, but we might need to think about when those projects need to be scheduled and when the money needs to be there to fund those projects, and that's why I asked the question. So one of the scenarios in the new packet that was sent to the commissioners um, you know, shows that the plan would support the issuance of uh, the the banked $20 million worth of uh, ABSS debt with, uh, I believe it was in fiscal year 2026. And we, we just made that up to demonstrate to you that the plan will support it. So if you decide to go uh, with the um, net 150, banking maybe $20 million in unissued but authorized ABSS debt, and you wanted to issue that debt, the, let's say the, the schools bring you projects that you approve of, you think you know are good, and you want to issue $20 million worth of debt later. Uh, we, we looked at 2026, that was I believe the last year it could be done, and it does fit. So uh, it would be significantly past the plan for issuing debt for the community college in 22. So I mean, but it, the, the plan would su um, uh, support issuing additional, the, the bank debt for the, um, I, um, School system in 26. In, in 26? So, yes, yes. Okay. If you if you if you bank unissued debt. Okay. Question for Mr. Gatewood. Um, there was funding for FFNE for the Center of Excellence that I think you were looking hoping yeah. to get you um, some of the premium that would be available to cover some of that cost. That is correct. I've been trying to raise my hand. They haven't raised it. <laughs> Good luck. I may actually get called upon. But, um, I pay attention when I'm in those uh, budget meetings. Right. You're budget exactly. committee meetings or, or finance committee meetings. Yes, sir. You're exactly right. And this whole idea of the premium, I understand exactly what you articulated, Mr. Lashley, in the gist of things. Okay, I don't get the details of the number so well, but I get the gist of it. But you're right, I would be derelict in my duty if I didn't also make you aware that we, again, we are fundraising for the FF and uh, furniture fixture and um, equipment. And that was a conscious decision so we could get the closer to the size building that we needed. And of course you have the, the length of the debt and what I appreciate versus what depreciates with the equipment. So as it stands, we we have raised we raised a million dollars from LabCorp. We raised twenty five thousand dollars from a uh, foundation, furniture foundation. As a matter of fact, that was interesting, but they saw the need. And last week we received a hundred ninety five thousand dollar grant from the Golden Leaf Foundation. So my point is, we're working really really hard to raise this money but we may not raise it and so we don't want to have we want the building but we want to be able to open that building operate that building effective of august or so next year so that we can have classes in it and get on with the business we need to do for our county and students so if if you could find some way to help us we need about three million 
3.7 million or so to to uh, fill the bill on the furniture fixes and equipment and so and I, I would be derelict if I didn't make you aware of that before you decide here on how you spend the and that's premium about no premium. three million in addition to what you've already raised correct yes sir yes and dr. Gaywood you were so kind to explain to us in our meeting uh, this past Wednesday would you explain to the everybody listening the difference between uh, Alamance County students versus out-of-county students uh, that population and generally uh, the extra monies that are coming into ACC because of the out-of-county would you ex give a, yes. an explanation as to that yes I'll, I'll um, if I may sure please so and, and there's a lot of reasons for what I call swirling we have students who go to Guilford Tech I probably shouldn't call other schools names I want to keep Alamance in the forefront here <laughs> <laughs> but they go for things that we don't have that we unfortunately can't afford to have right now. And one of those things, when they go to the college in, in the west of us, is um, dental hygiene. And there are other things where students go to other schools out of other counties, and we have those who come here. And here's what happens when they come here. With the, um, we're funded based on FTE, full-time equivalent, so it takes often three or four students to make one full-time equivalent student. And based on that funding and some reports that Matt Banco ran for us recently, we're getting about six million dollars. Matt, is that the right number? And yes. uh, uh, funding to assist us in running Alamance Community College so that we can provide the infrastructure, I don't mean capital infrastructure, but I mean operating expenses and teacher expenses to teach all of our students. Alamance and that's County because of out-of-county students. That is correct. It is it is a, a blessing to us. And they buy gas, they buy food, and they shop at Tango Outlet and other places too. So we, there are uh, residual benefits for the county that are not obvious to us in, uh, as we uh, just look at that $6 million that goes far beyond that. So it's a really good deal. Well, we generate the return to the county on a dollar invested at ACC. Yeah. I've always felt like that's something we need to bring up over that is and correct. over and over again. For every dollar invested in Alliance Community College, the return on that investment is four dollars and forty cents, which I think is a pretty good deal. It's better than the, the premium here. It's really, <laughs> it's, it's a really good deal, and that goes to support this college, your college, which we want to make um, the very best we can for the people of this county. While I have the floor, Mr. Chairman, if I'm not overstepping, I do want to acknowledge that I have Matt Manko and Tom Hartman virtually joining. And so if I have missed anything about anything that has transpired this morning, I would certainly like for them to fill in uh, the void, if that's uh, permissible, sir. Oh, sure. I, I just wanted uh, all the county residents to understand that, yes, we are bringing in um, Guilford County, Orange County, you know, residents from other counties, right. we are benefiting financially from that. And it's not Alamance County taxpayers paying for the out of county folks. Instead, we're receiving additional dollars because of that. That is correct. We were receiving a huge benefit. Yeah, I just had a dental process, uh, my annual or regular checkup, and my, my, I asked my hygienist that question. And, because we don't have hygiene here, we have dental assistants. That's correct. She had her hygiene classes at Guilford Tech. So, um, I don't know if that's a program y'all are looking at adding. I know we've got a lot of stuff well, going on. Well, I'll come your... back to you and ask for more money. We, we'd love to have it <laughs> for facilities because we, the facility we have for that, it cannot accommodate both those programs as it stands. Right. Is it in order to put a gag order on Mr. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom Hartman's virtually in it and I, I just feel like that's probably something he may want to add about all of this. Uh, if, I don't know how you get him in the space here. Tom, are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hear you clearly. All right. Yeah, the only comment I had just to share with the commissioners, and good morning, everyone, good, good to see everyone, is just in terms of uh, the conversation earlier about 
possibly delaying the bond sale and how that might affect the ACC. Uh, the biggest challenge we would have is we also have oversight by the North Carolina State Construction Office. And if it, with the bond, if the bonds were not sold in, in April, uh, the project would come to a stop. They would not allow us to move forward. Uh, even, they wouldn't even allow us to bid the project at this point. We're only authorized up through construction documents. So the project has to be fully funded and they're waiting to see the bond sale happen uh, in order to check that box that they can then approve us to, to move forward. So I just wanted to, to share that uh, that with the, the commissioners. Well, the commissioners, may I call the question? I believe, Madam Secretary, I believe I made the motion um, for the resolution authorizing the uh, bonds. And I think Mr. Carr seconded that motion. So we do have a sure. motion and a second on the floor. Any further discussion? Uh, point of clarification: Is this um, is it a motion to approve the resolution or to approve the actual sale? It's to approve the resolution, is it not? Which includes a sale of one hundred and fifty and twenty three point six. That's my understanding. That's correct. That, that is correct. If you approve this resolution, that means we will be going to the bond sale on April twentieth. We will. Uh, uh, not sell bonds to exceed the principal amount of a total of $173,760,000, dollars $150,000,000 for ABSS, $23,760,000 for ACC. So if you approve this resolution, we're going to move forward. Uh, proceeding to the bond sale, the next item on the agenda is where you will give me direction about premiums, okay. no premiums, net. Okay. Just we're to keep not it delaying clean. it. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Again, unanimous. Thank you. I have to decide how much to borrow. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Haycat. <laughs> Thank have you. We totally Mr. confused Mr. you now. <laughs> One second. Matter has not changed. Thank you. Could, could we take a two-minute recess? <coughs> Go back in session. Mr. Haygood, if you'll finish this item and then we have a, another item that we need to shift to. Sir. So uh, I'm going to go through some just discussion about uh, premiums versus uh, taking the reduction of principal issued. I think we've had a lot of this discussion, but I want to cover this uh, just so to make sure we're all on the same page. And myself and the staff will be listening to make sure when we go on the 20th that we follow the wishes of the board. So. The commissioners have now uh, voted uh, approved the resolution that we will be issuing the education bond debt on April 20th. We're listening to hear from you at, at this, after this presentation how you want to use the bond premium. We've had a discussion about it. Uh, you can either use it to add funds to the project funds, taking more than uh, the $150 million, or uh, you can use it to downsize the issuance and bank uh, authorized but unissued general obligation bond debt for ADSS. These numbers were based on March 16th. You heard it might be closer to um, $20 million now. So we won't. We just won't know until the 20th when we actually sell how much premium uh, we could have access to. And uh, we're looking at around $3 million in possible premium for ACC. And that was one thing I did not. Uh, here for sure in our last conversation just a moment ago it sounded like the commissioners were interested in downsizing the principal for uh, the school system but I uh, didn't know if the, and you'll need to let make sure we know what to do about the community college do you take the premium as additional cash or do you downsize their 23,760 um, uh, debt issuance so I do have a note on this slide that says these these premium amounts and interest rates are going to change we don't know for sure what it will be until we're actually on the 20th selling, but we feel like these are pretty close numbers. And you've also been provided in your packet information from the school system that lets you know uh, right now, based on uh, the bids that they're getting back for eight of the nine projects, they're looking at about $6.1 million in, in uh, savings that they may have from their 150 million. So what I wanted to make sure the board understood going into this conversation, it wasn't 100% clear to me if you wanted to take the additional dollars or downsize the debt, but I wanted to ensure the board knew if you take additional dollars or we realize additional dollars either through savings. Yes, sir. Can I ask a quick question on that? You said a $6 million savings. Is that net savings 
yes. uh, among all the projects. That's correct. Because there was a, a one or two projects that were coming in over. I think, Am I correct, uh, Mr. T Mr. Thorpe. The only project so coming six point one million is net yeah. savings from all the bond projects. That's right. Uh, the information I'm looking at every uh, the Southern High School renovation was about estimated. These are estimates. Seventy two thousand five hundred ninety dollars, I believe, over budget. And the Williams High School renovations was one point nine million dollars, roughly over budget. The other uh, projects are coming in under budget. Pleasant Grove is an exception. Right, we don't we don't yet have the uh, bid amounts for Pleasant Grove. Brian, can I absolutely can I add this? Yes. Um, if you look at the high school, the new, oh, new high school, it is on budget, but it's minus the vocational building because it was an alternate bid and some other alternates, uh, such as Pam's comment to the tennis courts and stuff. It would take about two point five million, two point six million, to make that connection to build it complete. Uh, there's a gap there. So, yes, the bid did come in at budget, but some of the alternates that we had to shift there so we could get there. Because uh, of steel prices? Because of the inflated prices, yes, ma'am. So, so when, when will we be able to lock in our steel cost at the time? We have our, we have our steel cost locked in right now till April 20th. Okay. I mean, we've, we've, we've got it locked in typically seven days is all they're locking it in. But they have locked in until we can get the bond sold. And I think only two of these projects are uh, construction manager at risk, the new high school and southern high school. The rest of these are bids. But uh, one concern I think we would want to keep in our minds is I guess you could have change orders for some of these if you ran into problems during the court. Even though the bid is low, you know, they're not guaranteed maximum price as you would get through the construction manager at risk. So, Correct. you know, while the bids are... Some saving some, right? There's a possibility even with a bid, if they run into a problem, it could go a little higher than the bid price. So the, we can use that 6.1 million for overruns on the other projects. Overruns as well as other items on those sites that need to be done. There's there's work on those sites that need to be completed as well. Is that just for school system or for ACC? Excuse me, you're out of order, sir. Continue, please. So uh, I will say that the $6.1 million is strictly for the school systems. The community college, we don't have the bids in hand, final bids in hand yet. We knew that was going to be the case with the Biotech Center of Excellence, uh, and the LGC said you can go ahead and bid. And then uh, Student Services Center, again, LGC permission, but we don't have the actual final bids for either one of those projects, but should be getting them fairly soon. So. But I think it's important that you recognize there's about $6.1 million total savings on the ABSS projects right now as Todd mentions and I'm going to cover there's some alternates that are unfunded and you know uh, seven of those nine projects are not construction manager at risk so you could see some change order come up that would possibly make you want to think about tapping into that six point one million but uh, as we were talking we've been I had all this talk about premium taking this cash more than 150 million it sounds like the board has some thoughts already about uh, what to do but I wanted to make sure the board knew if you did that, if you wanted to take more than the 150 million, which is going to give you more money than the original projects called for, the original budgets called for, you'd have more money. Um, or we could also see additional funding from bond project savings, right? That's $6.1 million. I hope that it will prove true. Uh, if it does, or we get any interest on bond proceeds, right? What I would suggest to the commissioners is that for the college and the school system, we would create in the bond accounting a future project account for both so if you if you had uh, savings the commissioners could consider doing budget amendments for each project once the final bids are actually known and it's locked in we feel comfortable amend the budget you could transfer those savings to a future project account for the for the school system you could do the same thing for the community college then uh, whenever Susan realized interest on bond proceeds either for the college or the school system those, those interest that interest has to be spent on these um, projects too, I would suggest you may want to consider putting it in a future project account that you could tap later. And I'll, I'll right. explain how that would work. But the same thing with premiums. If you were going to take premiums as cash above and beyond the original budgets and plan, I would suggest you you would put it there. Right then, you would be able to determine what to do with it. But in that event, any amendments to ABSS and education uh, ACC education bond project project amounts like an alternate 
or a change order that put the but put the cost over the approved budget that's been approved by the board or if the college or the school system wanted to do a new project using bond proceeds I think we discussed this with Dr. Benson the process that any of that would run through would be TRC review that's our staff level review right college school system and county staff reviewing these projects then it would go um, if, if there was an alternate that wanted to be funded with those banked uh, future savings uh, future project account funds it would go to the um, capital oversight committee which includes uh, chairman paisley and vice chair carter that the case would be made there the oversight committee would make a recommendation that would finally come here this board would have to approve if you were going to spend anything out of that future project account so if you had savings bond interests or any premiums you would have the final word on how to apply it to school or college capital but the premium premium portion of it would have a deadline on when it had to be spent that's correct yes uh, and I don't know if the interest and in savings would too uh, Susan is that is that correct it does. so there would be there would be some time limit on bond interest and this 6.1 million dollars worth of savings also is that 2024 is that correct yes it would be three years and that process to review projects proposed projects would be the same if the commissioners say we don't want any premium in cash we want to downsize the issuance and take 130 million uh, and take use the premium to get the 150 million that would leave you with the 20 million dollars worth of authorized but unissued geo bond debt that that you can issue uh, you know you have the seven years and you can do an extension but to issue that debt would take the same process. The schools uh, would have to come to TRC and say, we've got a list of projects here that cost anywhere up to $20 million. The technical review committee would bring that same list of projects to oversight, capital oversight committee would review, and then it would come to the board of commissioners. And as Susan reminded me, you would go through the very same process. It would be issuing debt. All, it would be again, you would issue debt. So you would go through the same thing we're going through here today. And, but, to issue those, and to issue those additional bonds unissued, we would have until 2025. Seven years from the uh, vote, 18. and you can do an extension on that, too. I yes, have sir. a question. Uh, so you're saying because um, because the market is beneficial to us, we only have to go to the bond market to get on 130. They're going to give us 20 in premium, 150. Because we're doing that, you're saying that technically, we still have 20 million more dollars of bonds that we could go get at a later date. That's correct. How? The, the voters issued uh, the approval of up to $150 million worth of- uh, not, not, the premium doesn't matter here. That's right, that's just, right. Just want everyone to hear this. Premium you doesn't would, matter here. We, so it right. actually gives us, it freezes up, gives us a little bit of uh, leeway. Uh, we're getting the dollars for HBSS that they asked for and we're, the market is generous in the sense that we're coming to the market at a good time so now we've actually got ourselves a little bit of leeway in case something else comes up now i don't want people to think that we got 20 more million dollars that we can go get in debt because uh mr cole may understand this more than anything you know right now the bond market's favorable to us because we don't have 150 million dollars in debt but if we go back to the bond market in 18 months our situation with <coughs> ACC's not affected because that's in this plan. Sure. But if we were to do 20 more million dollars because we have it, bond market's not going to be so look at us so favorable this time. That, that's a possibility, absolutely. Because now we have the we actually have the ability to go to to go bank, bank, bankrupt in the sense of not fulfilling our obligations for the bond. That's how the bond market looks at it. That's not how it is. But that's how the bond market risk managers are going to look at it. Now you have ability to actually, you didn't have $150 million to, to, to go up, but now you do. Sure. So bond traders are just going to look at you like, you know, now you got more debt. I have to keep a closer eye on you. Who Try are trying. these people? I'll be more than happy to bring them in here and introduce them to you. They're, I mean, they just got money. Here's another $20 million. $20 million does not scare the bond market. They it trade billions me. a day. Jeez. 20 20 million bucks is a um, rounding error to those guys. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Mr. Lashley, Mr. Cole did make one good point though in in a, in, a, in the communications we I saw over the weekend that uh, the 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 indications for Alamance County and the changes in Alamance County's economy are such that we're looking at a good chance of an improvement mm -hmm. in our already good bond rating. Mm -hmm. When we've got a double A2 we could improve. What would be the next step on that, Mr. Cole? 
it would be a double A one. And I, I think that's a reasonable expectation over time. If Which could bring us an even lower rate, right? Yes. To, to grow and, and, and whatnot. I agree. So that that's correct. If uh, it, any any expenditure of funds, not the not the original bond projects, right? They the, the schools and the community college have that all laid out. They're in place. Once you set the final budgets after the debt is issued for them, uh, they'll they'll go and do the, that work. This process of reviewing uh, expenditures only happens if you were to take some premium as cash, or we actually bank some uh, project savings or interest, right? Then anytime, if we create this future project account for both groups, anytime money comes out of that for something else, it comes here in the end, and you would vote to do that. Again, same thing with issuing an additional amount of debt. It would have to come back here, you would approve it, and go through the same process. Uh, and what I would suggest to the board is that if you were gonna use a future project account for ABSS and ACC that was made up of savings, earned interest, possible premiums, you know, the, the reasons you would use that in my, my mind would be to make sure that the original bond projects actually get done, right? That there's a slate of, of, of projects that the, the public have voted on. As I mentioned, a couple of them are construction manager at risk, but some of them are, are bids. There's a chance that uh, something would happen to drive up those costs. To me, if you have savings or bond in, uh, proceeds from interest banked, that would be a reasonable use right. to make sure those original projects that the public were told about get done. Uh, as Dr. Thorpe mentioned, there are some of these projects that have alternates that may not fit in the budgets uh, that have been bid. That's a reasonable use for the board to consider using savings or uh, uh, any of these accumulated cash to, to fund. Or if the, the school system and the uh, community college came up with new projects that they wanted to do that could come to the commissioners and make that case, but it would go through TRC oversight, then to the commissioners to say, there's a, a million dollar project at Williams that we want to do that wasn't part of the bond. It's in these bond figures. The bond, uh, the cash will support it. The bond order will support it. Um, I think that's, that's uh, those are reasonable uses of those kind of funds. Uh, some of this is uh, old hat. The premium funds must be spent within three years. Uh, premium funds, uh, we've checked with our bond council. You can use them to pay interest on bond debt during construction, but that's really it. If you, if you take premium, as, uh, as Ted mentioned, you really want to have a planned use for it. You want to know I've got $20 million worth of things that we're planning to do. And we already have the funding in place to pay the interest anyway. So. Yes, yes. Uh, Non-issue geo bond debt expires seven years, can be extended. Uh, we're, we are unclear about the use of American Rescue uh, Plan funding at this time. Hopefully we will be getting that uh, very soon, and uh, my hope is by the summer. And you know about the early bond payback, <clears throat> subject to 10-year no prepayment. There's also information in your packet. Uh, we ask that report to run new plans, new finance plan scenarios. The commissioners mentioned looking at what happens to the capital plan, the capital financing plan, if property tax revenue is reduced. There are multiple scenarios. We don't have to decide this today, but we are getting close to budget time. And the commissioners asked about what happens to the plan if you start reducing property tax revenue. Uh, the scenarios that are in there uh, show premium, no premium. They show uh, banking, uh, uh, authorized but unissued geo bond debt. And then there's a couple of scenarios that show actually issuing it in 26, that the plan will still um, support it. Uh, we didn't show a plan, a scenario, for not taking the premium funds for ACC. Um, and the only reason was the consensus seemed to be last time that that was the desire of the board was to take premium funds as cash for ACC. That may have changed. We'll be listening here in just a moment to, to know if that's the case. The scenarios, when you look at them, as we get closer to budget time, and we'll be talking about you know, what does a property tax revenue reduction do to capital reserves? Do you feel comfortable? Some of these, a couple of these, particularly the two cent property tax reductions meant a property tax increase was probably gonna have to be done again later, right? To continue to fund the plan. When you look at it, you can see in later years to keep the plan going, you would have, the board of commissioners at that time would have to raise taxes or uh, would have to consider that at least. So um, I just wanted to mention it because it is in your plan. The board asked to see that. You have it, and I'm sure we'll be talking more about it as we get to um, as we get closer to budget. But I think at this point, the commissioners have uh, voted to, to go to the go to the market on the 20th. The one thing I would ask about premium uh, is there is a cost to bond issuance, right? 
we're looking at, uh, I was speaking to Ted just a moment ago, to issue this uh, uh, up to $173 million, between $800,000 and $1.2 million in cost to issue this. Mm -hmm. You can either take premium to cover that cost and leave the project funds for the college and the school system at 150 million and 23.7, or it comes out of the uh, project cost. That's the commissioner's decision. That is a way you could use premium. Did so, you just say they charge us to borrow money? Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Who Definitely. Are these people? They're called commissions. <laughs> yes. Why are we paying to borrow money and to we, owe them our life? I don't understand. That's what. That's how we make money on Wall Street. And you Street. did this for a living. Oh yeah, but with two hands. <laughs> And this was one of the reasons why we tried to limit the number of debt issuances to as few as possible because we knew there would be a cost and at the time we were planning we didn't know if there'd be a premium or not so if you don't use premium and the board does not have to use premium but if you don't it will come out of the project costs right so we, we would pass that on to the amount of money that's available to ABSS and the school system. So. The relative cost just to make a point uh, so very similar to when you when you get a mortgage on your home you pay points you pay attorney's fees, you pay pay for the cost of getting that mortgage. This is the same thing. Yes. It's just a relative cost to the mm -hmm. to the total exposure. I so just I, look at the monthly. That's, all I pay attention to, so. that's what most people do. They yeah. look at the bottom line. How much am I going to pay each month? So I think we've got Ted and Susan and Andrew and myself here. We are listening because we want to make sure when we go in on the 20th that we are very clear what the commissioners want. Uh, do you want premium as additional funds or do you want to downsize that principal and take uh, take less to get the 150 million and the um, 23760 and uh, that that question about the bond issuance cost I think that's a reasonable thing for you to consider it's either premium in the in the amount that we'll know what the cost will be or it's coming out of project, uh, I, the think project from, cost. I think from what I've heard our interest appears to be to get the 150 million net for use for the bond projects and probably take enough of the premium to cover the borrowing costs so that sure. we bank 150 million to get the jobs done and then we then we have the net difference in the uh, unissued bonds to look at in the future and then I have a I have a real horror of having the center of excellence finished and not having equipment in there for us to open for students so I'm thinking on the center of excellence, I would like to see us look at that premium and make sure that we get enough of that premium so that if we fall short on fundraising, we have enough to get the uh, equipment in there to operate that building when it's done. How much will the equipment cost for the building? About four million. The total is about five million, mm -hmm. but we've got, but you've got about enough to where we only need three point seven. I, I really gotcha. believe we'll get another three or four hundred thousand, so if we could get three million dollars, we'll be absolutely ready to open that building. Mr. Carter, is that a motion? I, I'll make that in the form of a motion. Please, please, please. Oh. Uh, Mr. Mr. Thorpe is raising his hand over here about something. Go ahead, Todd. <laughs> Just, yes. uh, again, just want to remind everyone, you know, it's 2.6 million in the new high school. And I'll Beg say pardon? 2.6 million to complete the high school. Uh, also, I mentioned that our last meeting is about $2.5 million worth of road improvement in front of Southern High School, Southern Middle School, that we're going to be forced to do, and about 600000 for the new high school. Our intention is to go to Brian and back to you to ask for it out of capital reserve, uh, but if we could use bond premium. So that's about another $6 million. Another $6 million to, to be complete. So I. I how do you catch up? I will amend my motion to allow to take. You can spend it faster, you can make it. Beg your pardon? You spend it faster, you can make it. Six I'm, million dollars. I'm, I'm not understanding what you're doing. I'm just talking out loud. I'm sorry. Mm. Just a little frustrated right now. I apologize. You just. Um, um, we, well, we don't it's have been a so long. Well, hold on one second. It's been so long since there has been a school built. I watched Smith go up across the street from me. It was amazing, just amazing. I mean, it's like they dropped it out of the sky like Lowe's when they built Lowe's on the corner. Um, everything has so many zeros. I used to, oh God. And anyway, but we, we, we're adding on and we're, we're adding on, we're adding on and our county is growing and growing and growing. I'm real concerned about seniors. I know they took a hit, everybody's took a hit. But when we're looking at building a high school and 
when you when you're to a point now where you're going to start taking stuff away that that's not that we can't we just we have to be real smart about stuff like that I mean we've been to some schools there are schools in this school system that aren't going to get nothing done and I mean nothing and um and we it's such a need it's just I mean you just need like a a wand but um I, I just don't want us to Lord, I just want it to all just work out perfect, don't I? But I just don't don't have all these plans and then start taking, but yet all these premiums, this is so over my head. I just don't want, I don't want to put anything else on the taxpayer because that's who foots the bill for everything. I'm a taxpayer. But at the same sense, every child that walks into a school is our very future. They're being trained in school. They're being trained at ACC. We were at ACC. Lord, that's places like a... A rock star. I mean, we are. That's a gold mine. I'm so proud that it's in my county. I um, mean, and everything. So I just, when we think about stuff like this, this is hard decisions, and they mean we're going to be liked, we're going to be disliked. But that's part of this game. Nothing should surprise on that. We have so many issues to deal with. But this is. It's like we're always trying to catch up, and catch up, and catch up. By the time you catch up, you're still behind. So um, I just want us to make the right decision. When I know how hard. The, what the school system has done and the work they've put into this, just like what the county does and the work they put into this, nobody sees all that. It's unbelievable everything, and I, I swear you have to pay somebody to think nowadays, literally. It's unbelievable. And uh, But I just, I just want us to make the right decision that is a good, healthy balance for everybody. But um, think, about, think about young people because they're going to grow up and they're going to take care of all of us one day. And if they're not prepared and equipped, you know, not just talent but morally ethically everything the influence in their lives we're, we're seeing a lot of that we are seeing a lot of that and um and i i just want us just to just do the right thing that's all mr chairman if i could if i could ask if the commissioners would consider doing this in the form of two separate motions so it's very clear sure. for staff what what the board desire is for the abss debt and what to do with premium and what the board desire is for the community college i think if you do two motions just it, that would that would certainly help us know that we're going into the 20th doing exactly what the board wants so yeah I appreciate that right now we don't have a second on the other motion okay. so therefore there is no motion um, well, the gentleman restate well I motion. interrupted you so yeah, thank just you. hold on thank you just restate your motion I just yeah. Yeah, I got sidetracked um, I'll be glad to amend my motion okay I'll make a motion at first for Alamance Community College to issue the debt to include a premium to net enough to support you're saying you need about three million yes. to get enough equipment or, or to help f close out the deal so that we have the equipment to open the center of excellence when it's complete are you also including the amount needed for the bond issuance itself. Yes, yes. that's what I need. Yes. Uh, what, what would that number be? The bond issuance cost? Uh, with the uh, motion that uh, Commissioner Carter is making, could you um, just give me, can you give me the number that you're talking about? Three million. What, what, the number plus the three million? That's how I'm looking at it. 6 plus 3. 23.76. That would be a way to do this motion that would maximize the amount of money. If that if that's what the board wants to do is get the most premium possible for ACC, which I think we're estimating is possibly around three million dollars at this time, then if you move to uh, issue par at twenty-three uh, twenty-three million seven hundred sixty thousand dollars, that is for both the center of excellence and the student services center. That is the principal. That is par. Uh, then if you you can either put a dollar amount cap on the amount of premium that you would like to take or instruct us to take as much premium as possible which I think we have estimated as I say around three million dollars that is a guess we don't know for sure what it will be and that closing cost would be paid from that premium and, and then you, you would determine what to do with the premium the extra cash that would be we would put it in a future <laughs> project account the college can make the case to TRC OSC and finally to you about using it for 
equipment or whatever else, but the board would approve. But that's the only reason we would do that is because of equipment. That's, right. that's the reason, right? Well, the only other thing I think the board talked about at its last meeting is there was another debt issuance for the college. So that, you know, if, if you have premium and you, now let's say the college raises several million dollars for equipment and maybe they only need a million of the three that you get in premium, you may want to just make a million of it available and keep that other two million till the next debt issuance in September of 22 and see do you need to borrow the entire amount in September of 22 or, or, or what you would want to do. Well, that project won't be finished until then anyway, is that correct? It'll be finished in, I think it's August 22, yes. Okay, we're gonna need some help with the numbers, I think. Yeah, so. I just, I'm, a, I'm a bit confused here. And I just, I think it's one question could solve it pretty easily. The biotech center that the 23760s you're gonna get from the bond market, now you're saying that you want to go borrow some extra money so you can buy furniture for the place to, to help him with his, I mean, he's fundraising, but you want to go borrow two and a half million more dollars more to pay for furniture for this building that's not built. Taking the premium, yes. Was that included? Carrying money cost, the cost of carry is expensive here. Question, Mr. Chairman. It's kind of hard to... Go get yes. six million dollars when you're spending money. Um, and this may be a even Mr. Albright question. Um, the voters approved the bond package. Does the language allow? Does it authorize us to to get money for the furnishing of, as opposed to the capital improvement of, projects? The, the bond order talks about <coughs> capital improvements. I believe. Doesn't talk about personal property. It did. The bond language, the referendum that the voters approved was for renovation, construction, as well as furnishings and equipment. Thank you. That's good to know. I don't Thank remember. you. <coughs> I stand corrected. I didn't remember that. I, I couldn't remember either. That's that's why I'm sure. I, I had to read that one before. So <laughs> is the center of excellence over budget? No, no, we don't we don't actually have the bids for student services or center of excellence at this time. We know the estimated uh, budget for both buildings. All right. All right I, I don't think see how it's intellectually. It, it's it's to say we're going to take premium at all for ACC and not for ABSS. I think is um, inconsistent. I think it's inconsistent. If we take premium for the funding of both bonds so that the dollar value equals what the voters approved that to me is consistent yeah. and is also consistent with the approval um, and I know that there may be some unfunded wishes and maybe even some unfunded necessities uh, but I think to, to treat those differently is inconsistent and I think we need to treat them consistently. Right. Well, let me add some information that I've obtained from ACC. When they intent, when they initially did the planning and budgeting for the bonds, they anticipated trying to do fundraising for furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And you got to remember, the Center of Excellence is a high-tech facility. The equipment's going to cost a lot of money, and they thought they could raise the money. This, as you well know, has been a difficult market to go out and get donations. And so that's what they're running into right now. They've, you, you've got about a million. Million. Uh, let's see. Uh, about a million three. About a million three. So they're about two million seven short of the four million they expected to cost. Now they thought they'd have that, and they and they could still get that before the end of this project. But it's we don't know when this is all going to go away, and how much easier it's going to be to raise money. And as I said a few minutes ago, the last thing I want us to see is to have a brand new center of excellence open or ready, and we can't put anybody in it because we don't have the equipment to train anybody when it's in it. That would be a travesty. Um, if we, and the premiums, the reason, I, the way I see this, the reason for not taking a premium for ABSS right now are, is we don't know how much money they're going to have to use on some of these other projects from federal funding where right now the indication from 
Dr. Gatewood is maybe the most they're going to get in federal money. It might be about three million. Is that right? Four million. Four million. Four million. But that's a big difference between their bond and the school system's bond. I mean, that's big, huge, and to me, to me personally, the chairs and the equipment for Dr. Gatewood is just or just as important as the vocational building at the new high school. I'm, I'm with Craig on this one because I mean they're going to serve the same purpose and principle. I can't. It's like. Um, Are we leaving that out in the in the high school? Are we leaving furniture fixtures and equipment out? No. No, I was no. talking about the vocational building for the tennis courts, things that he's going to have to swipe out to, to yeah, go for the steel. Yeah, the $150 million we were wiping out the vocational building? With the increase yeah. on the steel prices. With the new high school, the vocational, with the, the bid that's there, the vocational high school is not a part of that, or the vocational building is not a part of that. It's about an extra $1.6 million, $1.7 million just for that building, uh, then the tennis courts and other uh, upgrades was about 2.6 million. Can that come out of the 6.1 million in savings we've got on other projects? There, if you don't have overruns in those projects and you know, when we went to the community, to the voters, we said we were going to spend X amount of this school, X amount of this school, X amount of that school. So there again, we're doing something different than what we told the voters when they approved the bonds. And these other schools don't have a construction manager. So if something happens, there's nobody to eat it except what you got in savings. Um, and the, out of the six million I just spoke about, <clears throat> there's about three million in there in highway improvements. Yeah. If the state has the money, and right now they've given us all indication, that could actually be a reimbursable money. Right. So you take six million at the end of the project. If we can ask, excuse me, ask for close to three million back for reimbursable money, that's money that can go either towards the bond debt or into the capital funds right. for future buildings. But in order for us to get permits, we have to do these upgrades, or DOT will not give us permits. And I, and I, I was trying to address that in my motion for ABSS, but we aren't there yet. So again, uh, when is the Center of Excellence due to be completed? 2020. August 22. 22. Well, they need to raise about three more million dollars between mm -hmm. now and August of 2022. Yeah, that's what that. yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's a little frustrating. I've been working on it two years and I've been able to raise about a million dollars. Yeah, a big old hole here. Yeah. I don't understand. Todd right. just reminded me the furniture and all needs to be six to nine months. I beg your pardon? But the furniture and equipment needs to be in place for order about six to nine months. I'm sorry, months. I can't hear what you're saying. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. He's saying six to nine months. He six to nine months order. before the building's completed, we need to have the furniture, fixtures, and equipment order. settled. And, and you have ordered. 16 months. Yes. Right. So you're saying we could do that out of the second issuance for ABS or for ACC? I uh, doubt it. Okay. But we also don't have a final budget for the Center of Excellence. That's true. Or the Student Services Center. Here's where I am. Um, the voters approved a bond amount of 150 and 23.760. Uh, there are needs that are above that, particularly with ABSS. But there are ways, there are five funding methods, I think, to fund projects that are outside the current bond issuance plan. Uh, one is potential savings from the, the 150. We don't know how much, if, all, if at all, but that's a potential source. One is the COVID money that the seventy-seven million dollars that of COVID money that, that that the school system is going to be getting of that, we know at least some of that money can cover HVAC, which consists of a consist uh, of a, a large amount of uh, additional projects that ABSS needs. 
Uh, the 33 million that the county can get could cover some of that potentially. There's also some additional infrastructure packages before Congress now. Uh, and premium as a final option could cover those costs. I think we don't know what those costs are. We don't know what the savings would be. We don't know what could fund it. I think it's irresponsible for us at this moment to put 20 years of debt on the county with projects that we don't know if other sources can cover. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we get these projects done. Mm -hmm. And don't misunderstand me. I think we need to get these projects done. I think if we have like a phase two plan, if we consider the 150 million phase one, there could be a phase two. We could rack and stack the priorities. We can say this is where we go. This is a plan that we need to have. And we can have that discussion as a community about what's a priority and about how to fund it. I think we need to get that done, but I don't think we need to get it done with premium for ABSS. I think if I'm being consistent in that approach, I think we need to apply the same plan to ACC. Uh, I think we need to get a final budget plan for both the Services Center and for the Center of Excellence. Uh, and I think we, there may be some room to, to, to amend that budget to allow some funding for, for that entire project to include furnishings. But if I'm being consistent in that application, I think we need to treat the ACC the same. And we've got a year plus, what, 14, 16 months to see how we can fully fund the rest of the uh, equipment for that, for that center of excellence, which is an important thing to do. Um, and we also don't know what, what funding sources can fund that particular project as well. We don't know that at this moment. That's where I am. Uh, certainly consider any other motions, but that's that's where I am. You want to put that in the form of a motion? I will. I move that. Um, oh, I'll, well, also, well, I'll put this in the motion. So I, I move that that we issue bond debt so that we take $150 million for ABSS, $23.76 million for ACC in our issuance. Um, further, that we take enough premium to cover the costs of borrowing that money so that the principal amounts of borrowing cover the amount that the voters approve. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good work, Commissioner Turner. Good work. Excellent. I'm going to apologize to everybody in the audience. Uh, we at this point have to move to another matter and postpone temporarily the uh, budget amendments under item number eight, one and two, and so forth. Um, so I move that we now go into a closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11, paren A, paren three, in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the Alamance County uh, attorney and the board and receive a report regarding claims made in the case entitled NAACP at all versus Alamance County at all. Second. We have a motion second. Any further discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, unanimous. We're in, in temporary uh, closed session. Mr. Haygood, uh, item number 8-1. We have uh, uh, Yancey King from Emergency Management uh, with us today to present this item. Yeah, I will say Commissioner Yancey is also serving as the Interim Director of Emergency Management. Betty Hatfield has retired and uh, we're in great great hands with Yancey. So yeah. glad to have him here today. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, what this is, this is a Emergency Management Performance Grant Supplemental. It's an, in add on to what we normally have for our EMPG grants for the year. This one is specifically for COVID related response. There are several items. There is a specific list that we can use this funding for. Uh, what we have proposed using it for was to upgrade some of our equipment, do a little maintenance on some of the stuff that we have used over the last few months uh, for our um, 
response to the COVID. And so the amount of this grant is $12,695.45. So that's what we're here requesting approval to go ahead and accept this grant. And the local match requirements already met by? Yes, we can in kind of match, we can match with that. Motion to approve. I'll second. Any further discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. And uh, commissioners, we have Tanya Cattle, our planning director, is joining us by Zoom. So Tanya's going to present this budget amendment also. Oh, Tanya, I think you're muted, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now can everybody hear me? All right, like this afternoon I have for y'all the information that was in your packet from Stewart. They're proposing the consulting services for the zoning ordinance for the small area of Snow Camp. Uh, we came before y'all and kind of gave some information on their first draft of their services. We've added quite a few meetings and of course uh, we added a subcommittee to help drive this initiative. And so with that, they have come up with a total of 59,100 for the proposal. This has been reviewed by all departments. So this is before you with everybody's edits. That's pretty much almost on the money with what you said it thought you thought it might cost, wasn't it? I thought it would be about 60,000 and it came in just thunder now. And commissioners, we are proposing to budget um, sales tax revenue that has been coming in above the current budgeted amount. So that is the proposals to pay for this with additional sales tax revenue unrestricted that has come in uh, over budget. Motion to approve. Second. Will there be additional cost in addition to this sum of money? I don't expect any additional costs. They handled our land development plan and stayed within budget. Never had a question that we'd stay within. I've covered more than enough public outreach, workshops, board meetings, all that to get them there in person for us. So I don't expect us to see any additional costs. Mr. Chairman, uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, do the consultants interact with, um, with the public hearings that we're going to have with citizens? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're always there. We usually have three or four consultants with staff, and there'll be two public workshops for that. And, and do you have a sense of when the, the public workshops begin? So it's a three-phase project, and the public workshops will come in phase two, which is kind of the preparation and preparing the ordinance, and then there's another public workshop in the implementation part to make sure we got it right. So, I mean, you're talking about this is a six to eight month process. So it'll take us a couple months to get us involved, three, three months or so probably to get two to three to get us involved. And then around that month, three or four, we'll probably have a public workshop and then we'll pick it back up towards the end, maybe between months six and seven to make sure what we've heard and what we're proposing feels good to them as well. When in that process do citizens have the opportunity to talk about their specific parcels? That will be, along the way, there'll be surveys and things put out for individuals to do. And then when they come to those public workshops, we'll have maps up and then they can kind of tell us where they're at on the map and what they think they want to do with their property, what they are doing and where they may want to do so that we can make sure we get theirs right. And that can be done in person and virtual. We're kind of looking at both, depending on what we need to do. Okay, so the consultants are part of that process. Are they the ones, are the consultants the one who are actually assigning um, proposed uses for each individual parcel or is that the the use of yeah, that your office helping us, but staff is actually going to propose it based on the land development plan and then citizens look at that and make sure that that's what they're comfortable with on their property so it's kind of all three kind of group but staff drives it probably more than consultants would and um our consultants they also have it in their mind that there may be some parcels or some areas that we just elect not to zone well, so I think we will come forward with zoning proposed for everything, and that will be something that planning board and board commissioners can make that decision at that time. We're paying for services to zone all a little over 3,000 parcels, so y'all can make that decision when it comes back to you all. Um, staff probably won't make a decision not to zone something. We leave that to you. Okay. 
I'll make recommendations, I guess. Is that correct, Tanya? They will make recommendations on locations versus act. We'll have to make the final decision. Yes, and you'll have a subcommittee that comes in there too. And those are members that either staff can pick for the subcommittee for the land development plan, staff pick people, and then commissioners pick members as well. So that we have a balanced committee to help move the project forward. Any additional comments? Do we have a motion? And a second. And a second. All right. There being no further comments, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? There are none. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, public comments. Are there any public comments? Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have one caller in the queue. Who is it? Good afternoon. You're connected to the county commissioners meeting. If you could state your full name and address and begin your three minute public comment. My name is Henry Vines, uh, 3450 Isley Drive, uh, Snow Camp, North Carolina. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just thank you. Uh, for your past vote on the trash plant for the sheriff's department. And I would like to propose something to y'all today and ask, you know, for your help. Uh, I would like for the county to start a campaign on uh, a week uh, that would be for cleaning up Alamance County and make it in the form of a proclamation uh, <coughs> all the citizens of the county along with businesses organizations civic civic organizations and all and uh, with an effort to try to clean up out this county um i would like to see you know coordinated with the other team so that we could get those orange bags and get them in locations uh around the county you know in the offices of the county government uh, maybe even in the schools uh, so that our school children could uh, you know, get involved in this as well with their families um, and create on the same time some kind of an educational program that would educate people the, the cost and, and the detriment that is causing our water. You know, our water here in Alabama County is really, really important. We have a lot of reservoirs in this county. We're very fortunate that we have the resources of the water that we do. But we need to, you know, protect it because all this trash that's being thrown out ends up in these reservoirs, which causes trouble when we try to process it in drinking water. Um, the other thing that I would like to see if we could uh, formulate along with that same line is like a hotline through the sheriff's department that if you see someone throwing out trash, get their license number, report it to the sheriff's department, know that this wouldn't be a way that, you know, you could actually issue a citation, but a call from the sheriff's department saying that you've been served throwing out trash, trash, and this could result in a thousand dollar fine, may put the fear of God in them a little bit. Uh, so I would just, would, you know, like to, See if y'all could come up with something for that and just add to what uh, we're doing with the sheriff's department and the uh, inmates and by cleaning up uh, the county. I noticed on TV there's several other counties that are doing similar projects. And uh, I, so I think it would be a great asset to the county yes, if would. we could do this and let's be a leader on this and make this happen. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask? We want to say thank you. Thank yes, you, Henry. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had sent you an email or a picture one time of these nets that go across a culvert that collect trash, and um, several counties across the United States have used them because I've mentioned Brian as well at um, Parks and Recreation because they would be somewhere like that. 
And also, um, do we have to, what's the deal with like, um, do not litter thousand dollar fine signs? You hardly ever see them anymore. And, and I have a feeling if you ever get caught for littering and you're arrested for it and you go to court and Let's you go. don't get out of it, you actually have to pay the fine. Um, it only takes a couple of examples to get that around because, I mean, it is become, we just kind of have these patterns of doing really well and then we get really slack. That's just human nature, but I think it's something you can't really, you can't really, if, until it's in your face, there's a sign right there. You, we really need to think about having that and then honoring that and really prosecuting that because um, it litters a mess. It just so tears up everything. I, I can only guess that those signs are from the state, but we do have a sign, a street sign mm -hmm. capacity in county maintenance. We do the street signs out in the rural county, so it may be that uh, I'll talk with Buddy and Joel about do they have the ability to print some of those. And if, you know, if the sheriff had a recommendation of right. streets that are roads that have been particularly bad that he might recommend. Maybe we could uh, check the DOT and make sure it'd be okay if we put them up, but uh, mm -hmm. that might be helpful. So. Okay, thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. I would not oppose. I think it's a wonderful idea. Oh, I do too. Uh, we want to ask that something be placed on our agenda for, for April 19th. I think that would be a good idea. Sir. Everyone agree? I yes. do. All right. I'll give this to you. That's, that's part of the of this. Oh, thank you. Okay, are there any commissioner responses? There being none, thank you. <laughs> uh, county manager. I have no report. All right. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? So I'll make that motion. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor of signify by saying I and leave it. <laughs> well, you know it's time as well. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.